Um, thank you again so for inviting us into your home and, and tearing it up a little bit. We'll put it back, I promise. Yes. Um, can you talk about the first time you met Martin Luther King? Um, just to kind of paint a picture. This is really going to be a conversation of like telling stories, visual stories of dialogue and sort of memories of what it was like. Yes, the first time I met uh, Dr. King was in uh, 1958, and he had come to South Carolina to talk about Montgomery and the Civil Rights Movement and those kinds of things at Trinity United Methodist Church. And Trinity United Ch Church was the central point for the movement in Orangeburg and with the students at South Carolina State College and Claflin. Uh, college. And um, we were all invited, young people who were involved in the NAACP uh, youth efforts, to, uh, to come over to see and meet uh, Dr. King. I was real young then, and so I was, you know, impressionable, but um, not really making a contact that Dr. King would know on a, on a real and personal basis at that particular time. The, the, the time that I actually came into his, his presence and consciousness is probably in, in uh, doing the Selma to Montgomery march in which I was um, in Mississippi at that time, but I was asked to come from Mississippi to Selma after the um, Bloody Sunday and John had gotten uh, a concussion and was suffering from trauma to the head. Um, and when I came, I was uh, assigned to the, uh, to the duties of being the logistical uh, person for the march uh, as we strategized on when we were going to go out and how soon it would be before we actually got involved and engaged in the Selma to Montgomery march. SNCC had decided earlier that it was, it was kind of done with marches. And, um, and John decided that he was going to, based on his own uh, consciousness and, and, and being a native Alabamian, that he was going to march anyhow. And we had a, 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 a kind of philosophy in, in the organization that whenever one of our people was injured or hurt or was, was um, uh, done in like John was, that we would respond and we would continue their project or program. So we had about uh, 20 people out of Mississippi that drove over the afternoon after we found out that uh, John was, um, was injured and, and airlifted out to, I think, Boston, uh, that we, we, we drove over about a two, two and a half hour, three hour drive and the next day we were on the ground ready to help with uh, uh, Dr. King and SCLC strategize about how we were going to go forward. And what was the feeling when you first, like you coming from, from SNCC to SCLC and meeting King, what was your attitude towards him as the sort of leader of this other movement and, and just even personally, what was, your, what was your impression of him? Well, I always had a kind of warm feeling for him. He was a Southerner, he had been around, he was one of the icons, one of the people that I looked up to. Um, and so that was the, the basis upon which uh, we actually met. Um, and we had some strategy sessions during Selma in which uh, we, um, we would discuss the, 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 what was unfolding in terms of the march, the route, when we were going to march, and, and those kinds of things. And then there was that injunction. And um, SNCC uh, had a, a kind of position that those kind of injunctions, we would generally violate those kind of injunctions to raise the political consciousness and awareness of the, of the people in, in those communities in which those things happen. And uh, there began to be a little bit of, of change in how we, how we um, related at that point. It, it, and uh, what I might say that might clarify that a little bit is, is that uh, we, we, we operated on different uh, uh, tactics and, and um, we believe that it was very important to organize. That was our, 
what we had learned over our experiences in Mississippi with the building of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the challenge to the Democratic Party to open up for uh, minorities and women uh, in the Democratic Party in 1964 with the Mississippi Summer Project. But we also had concluded that it was very important to, to, to learn for SNCC organizing skills so that we could go into a community and empower that community, uh, allow that community to become empowered so it could take over developing the strategies and, and, uh, and tactics that would, um, would uh, gain control of their, so that those communities could, could gain control of their destiny. So um, we, we just thought that it was better for us as we saw a changing movement tactically that we, we, um, we, would, um, we would focus on organizing as opposed to mobilizing. Uh, SCLC and Dr. King were involved in mobilizing communities and they would mobilize them for a particular goal. So they would ratchet up the kind of pressure, political pressure and, and economic pressure on the target, whether or not it's Birmingham or, or Albany or, or some other area and that you had some very defined short-term goals that you were trying to achieve and that you would, you would reach that. So there, there, were, there were little differences and that was exacerbated by, uh, I think, the position of, of uh, how you treat the injunction going forward. Uh, SNCC had worked with, um, with SCLC in, um, in Albany, Georgia and uh, along with Dr. King, and we supported the efforts in Birmingham with, with, uh, with um, the uh, Birmingham uh, Project uh, C, Project Confrontation. And so we had began to develop some dialogue with, with um, Dr. King. I had also uh, seen and, and heard Dr. King speak in uh, Atlantic City for the challenge to the Democratic Party. And at that point, he was supporting the efforts to accept the compromise that grew out of that challenge to include two representatives from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. But my, my, my relationship was through all of these various and sundry kinds of experiences. And later it would become much deeper and, and more passionate as, as we continue to, to uh, d discuss difference in tactics and the movement and assessment of all those things and, and the rest of it. Um, so, so it started out in, in, in Selma where we actually come together face to face and we actually define who we are each. And I always was of the opinion that people who were involved in the movement were all equal. There was no hierarchy. And SNCC certainly fought that kind of, of, um, of position or posture uh, throughout its history. And so, you know, you would just walk up and talk with a person like Dr. King and and he was very amenable to that kind of relationship. So Selma was the beginning, and that was the kind of first time we kind of shook hands and, and agreed to uh, disagree sometimes. And, but the most important thing was, was that uh, my role at that time was to make sure that the march continued in Selma to Montgomery. Some of the others in SNCC decided that they were going to start another campaign in, in, um, in, in Montgomery, and I stuck with the overall overarching objective that we had in mind. So um, I, I tried to make amends and tried to make sure that we kind of stayed focused on what the organization needed to be uh, focused on and, and uh, at the same time allow support for those who were deciding that they were going to go to Montgomery and, and, um, and start again in Montgomery, the Selma effort, the Selma to Montgomery effort. Can you talk a little bit about the, what the mood was like between the SCLC and SNCC and was there any kind of sense 
Uh, there are a lot of egos there, is there and, and generational things. Can you talk about a little bit of that? Okay. Friction. Um, things were, were going very smoothly uh, at the initial stage of that Selma to Montgomery kind of effort. Uh, John decided that he was going to be a part of that and ended up uh, leading the first march with Jose Williams. Um, Jose Williams was a, a, a fantastic organizer for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, one of the few organizers that they had. Uh, but he had a contingency of people who, who uh, were pretty good organizers too that worked under his kind of leadership. SNCC had been in, in Selma from, since uh, about two years prior to the Selma to Montgomery March. Bernard Lafayette was there, Silas Norman was there, and Silas Norman was the project director when that happened. And so we agreed to share the space and on the assumption that we were going to work out whatever kinds of strategies that, um, that we were supposed to uh, put together and work on in unity. Um, one of the things that we detected very early was, was that there was a working out of strategies along with the Justice Department. And we, and we were not notified about that. So we were kind of left out of, the, out of the loop. And so on that Tuesday, I don't know the exact date, but Tuesday when the march started out, we assumed that the march was going to go straight on through and th there was going to be a, a, another confrontation. But there was an agreement that you take the march from the church, Brown Chapel, across the bridge to the highway patrol. Then you would kneel and say a prayer and turn around. And that was called the turnaround march. Well, that created a lot of ang anguish, not only on the part of SNCC, but on the part of, of the clergy and all who assume that the march was ready to go forward and that they were going to, in fact, violate the injunction. Uh, the, the agreement on the injunction was, was that uh, the fed, federal government was going to, um, was going to uh, work out through the courts some kind of system to allow the march to go forward. Um, but we were not aware of that, and so people became very upset by that. And so we then activated a young man by the name of Willie Ricks uh, uh, to come in and start working with young people, the youth, and get them involved and engaged in marching through the city of, um, of, um, of Selma. And then at some point coming into the church group and saying, let's go, we're going to march. Uh, through the police and we gonna march because we have a right to march and uh, that created some 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 animosities between the two organizations and Dr. King called a meeting and at that meeting he talked specifically about uh, uh, Willie Ricks because he had known uh, Willie Ricks but uh, the the irony is is that he took it to say that you know he was Dr. King and he was calling the shots, and that we all needed to you know follow in in footstep, in lockstep with him. That's when some folk decided Jim Foreman decided to go to uh, to Montgomery, and and start another kind of campaign there in Montgomery, marching on the state capitol and beginning to set the tone. So whenever the march got there they would be coming into a situation where they were not restricted in the kinds of activities they uh, wanted to do. And so um, he went on to, to, to assure um, uh, Willie Ricks that he was, the, um, he was Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, you, need to, you need to fall in line. Um, Ricks just sat there, he, he, he was like, it was kind of unbelieving that Dr. King was targeting him, but he was sending a message that we are trying to do this march. Uh, we, we, we have some guidelines and parameters, 
that we haven't told you about. Um, but um, we will still expect you to kind of follow and we'll give you information kind of piecemeal. And that's when the, the kind of friction came in. And that was, again, basically tactical. It wasn't personal. But Dr. King used Ricks to t talk to SNCC because he knew Ricks. And he knew Ricks wasn't going to have any particular uh, response to him, an anger, a anger, an angered response, a challenge, or any of those kinds of things. So we all said we agree. We're going we're gonna to try to work together, and we're going to try to keep this from bub bubbling up into anything that was major. Well, the press during that time uh, picked up on it and talked about a, a kind of squirmish, a squirmish between. Uh, uh, the SNCC people and the SCLC people. Um, the irony is, is that later on, Rick's become one of the top communicators between SNCC and Dr. King. He had unchecked un un uh, access to Dr. King. He could go in to his office, walk straight in, go back and talk to Dr. King. And Dr. King developed a tremendous admiration for him. But uh, so it, 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 it was probably his perception that, that Willie Ricks would be the kind of person who would understand what he was trying to do at that particular meeting. And we moved on from there. So that, that, that was a, a perception that grew out of some of our bumping heads because then Ricks was the person who led those students and they were all over the city. They would get stopped on this street and the police would block it off and they'd go to another street and they'd block it off and they were just kind of moving around. But through that kind of motion, you get people engaged and active. And you also get the students engaged and active. And uh, we had passed the point of talking about how old did you need to be in order for you to be uh, in the movement. Uh, you could be whatever age where you understand that you were doing something that was going to be good for mankind, humanity, and that it was a part of your core social kind of consciousness being built and developed. And we certainly did not want to stymie any of that kind of activity. I want to jump ahead a little bit to like when the, in the North, when you get to the Watts riots in Detroit and, and uh, the more sort of violent protests. How did King react to that and how did that create, is there another schism between SNCC's response to, and you know, you and Stokely Carmichael's response to, to, the, to the northern, northern violence bubbling up? Um, let's say the Watts riots compared to King and did King overlook something in his nonviolent movement? Did he, did he not see that this could, would happen? Well, I, I think that uh, we, we were all kind of um, kind of caught off guard when you saw the rebellions begin. They started on, in Harlem and then Philadelphia and then later on, this was in 1964, that these first ones kind of got cranked up. And then Watts in 1965, which was probably the most massive uh, riots that you had. But what we saw it as a lot of people who were suffering from the same kind of poverty, the same kind of absence of the right to vote, the same kinds of health care, the same kinds of, of uh, employment opportunities were in the urban areas and they responded with whatever weapons they could find. And so what we had to do was we had to change the narrative or try to change the narrative and change it from being a riot to a rebellion. And so SNCC made a conscious effort to do that kind of thing and began to talk to many of these youngsters who were engaged and to find out exactly what their concerns were. Poor schools, uh, like I said, health care was terrible. Um, and, and the irony is, is that in 2017, 2016, it hadn't changed that much. The inner cities, were the same as the rural South, which is still poor, still have and don't want to have any better health care than they had during that particular time. So um, our position was, let's go in and work with those kinds of folk. And that began to creep into the organization. And I think it began to creep into to SCLC 
But the, the one thing that you, you got whipped with is anytime anybody threw anything, a rock, a bottle, or whatever it was, uh, they saw that as a riot and people being out of control and not concerned about the real issues. They were concerned about being destructive. So anything that smacked at looking like it was going to end up being a violent kind of pro process, uh, a tactic, a uh, strategy, then, um, and that was from the person who was looking at it um, perspective, not, not the people who were engaged. But the brutality, the police brutality in the urban areas just forced that issue, just forced that issue, just forced that issue, almost like you have with the uh, police shootings that have become uh, rampant in, in, uh, across the United States. So we tried to harness that and, 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 and we tried to respond to that. Uh, we did have um, two organizers that went into uh, one went to Columbus, um, Ohio, Ivanhoe Donaldson and uh, Winky, uh, William Hall went to Harlem and began to work on that. And then we began to work with, um, um, in Newark, with um, Amir Baraka and uh, um, what's his name? Um, I'm trying to think of the SDS. Tom Hayden was in, in a project in Newark. And so we, we kind of collected that information because we understood that the movement was a changing phenomenon and it would go through phases as we saw with the, the, the sit-ins, public accommodation testing and uh, nonviolent direct action. We saw it with the Freedom Rides. We saw it move from that uh, public accommodation testing to voter registration, and then we saw it move from that to empowerment, and it kept developing as it went along, and as it had successes, it would change, the tactics would have to change, and we were, we were beginning to talk seriously about coming up with a, a kind of philosophy that would bring people together based on that kind of philosophy and ideology. And so we were working on that too, trying to learn as much as we possibly could and the rest of it. I think SCLC was, was probably looking at it at the same time, but they were probably not looking at the depth of it and looking at the, the, the people who were engaged. You know, you can fall into the trap very easily of saying that you, you, it's okay to throw the baby out with the wash. And we thought that it was important for us to try to salvage that energy salvage that, that talent in a lot of instances, salvage that humanity by finding ways in which we could actually develop tactics and strategies that could be employed and harness all this negative energy and, 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 and those kinds of things, or that negative energy. So uh, we continue to work along with SCLC in our effort to, uh, to, uh, to work through that. And then it came to Atlanta. And that's when I think that it became an issue that we both had an opportunity to work on. Um, uh, I think SCLC took the position that we want to tamper it down. And ours was that we wanted to let the people know that there might be some other ways in which you can do this thing. But we're not going to condemn you for using what you have. And we used to have a kind of saying in the movement that if you couldn't do anything, spit. You had to do something. If you didn't, you lose your, you lose your, uh, your objectivity, you lose that, um, that, that consciousness, you lose, you lose yourself in not being able to do anything at all. And then you're beaten and you won't have a chance to, uh, to be successful. But we, we continue to, uh, to struggle through that together. But still, there, there are no real, you know, kind of rifts. Uh, maybe Dr. King would say something like, Stokely, you know you're not supposed to be getting arrested in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, Stokely would say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get arrested wherever I am, wherever there's segregation and there's immorality and those kinds of things. Uh, I am going to unjust laws. I am going to protest. 
And I'm going to protest all over, wherever it is, don't matter. Even if it's in Atlanta, Georgia, the home of both the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So we had that kind of relationship where we would go back and forth. And we also, um, for the purpose of getting people to understand how we related and communicated with each other, we tried to create that kind of comedic kind of gesturing around in the movement. It was so serious and we were so young that it was better to tell how somebody, you know, um, jumped out the window and ran down the street, and tried to keep from getting arrested and he got caught anyhow and you just too slow. That's your problem. Now, when we make you faster, then we'll bring you back in. But right now, you're going to have to sit on the sideline because you're too slow to do the work that we're trying to do. But it was that effort that you have when um, you, you, uh, you, 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 have to, you have to make it comical in order for it to go well. And we used to have names that we used to call Dr. King. We used to say D-Lord. But we'd say it in front of him. It wasn't, it wasn't an Adam. You know, it wasn't animosity toward him. It was just for us to be able to laugh sometimes when we say, oh, they're going again. They're getting ready to have another march. And it was, it was like laughter. We understood, but we also understood the seriousness of every action that we took because you could lose your life. You could put somebody else's life in danger. It was an, a, very, a very important issue that you were trying to raise. So you tried to do that kind of thing. I remember uh, when Dr. King was, um, we decided on the Mississippi Meredith March, the Black Power March, that uh, we couldn't take the march through Philadelphia, but it was the anniversary of the murder of the civil rights workers there. So we decided to get maybe 10 cars and we were gonna take the leadership over and we were gonna actually march in Philadelphia. And we did that. And um, when uh, we were marching, everybody was told that we we're gonna march up to the, to the courthouse. And we had already decided because the steps of the courthouse were lined with police officers. And uh, so we decided at that point that we didn't wanna put uh, Dr. King at the front and, and say that prayer. So Abernathy led the march. And uh, we got up to the to the uh, steps and Dr. Abernathy turned around to the crowd and he was beginning to open up and he said something like, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not giving the whole thing, but he said something like, you know, I, I, I wanna, I wanna be able to be here today and memorialize the three victims. And I want to uh, uh, ask for redemption for those who, uh, and forgiveness for those who um, murdered these three young men in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And somebody in the crowd behind him said, yeah, and we're standing right behind you. And at that point, Dr. Ab uh, Reverend Abernathy's eyes opened and he finished his prayer with the eyes open and then walked down to the group and said, you know, we need to leave here as fast as we can. And so I was not in the car with Abernathy and Dr. King, but on the way back to the car, Dr. King asked uh, Abernathy, Ralph Abernathy, said, uh, you know, we, we are, we are Baptist ministers. And he said, yes, sir. And he said, now, were you, were, you, were you scared when you were up there? No, sir. He said, well, that was the first time I've seen a Baptist preacher pray with his eyes open. And everybody kind of fell out. I mean, that was Dr. King's joke. He was committed to. He told jokes all the time. The funny part about him telling jokes was he didn't have the rhythm for jokes. So they would be all kind of, you know, you say, okay, all right, I'm gonna laugh, but I'm gonna laugh at you telling that joke. I'm not gonna laugh at the joke, but I'm gonna laugh at you telling that joke. But everybody fell out laughing. But we had to get back in those cars and get out of Philadelphia in Neshoba County very quickly. And we got back over. And it, it sounds ironic that you're in a place now where you feel the pressure, you feel the danger, and you're going back to a place 
where there's pressure and danger already, but this one feels a lot better than the one that you're in. So if that's the kind of life we lived when we worked and lived in the Alabamas and Mississippis and South Carolina and North Carolina, you, you, there was uncertainty about it. And I must say that, you know, we saw uh, Dr. King as a generational and SCLC is a generational group above us. They were older than we were. And you also have to remember that we were young kids. When I went to Mississippi, I was 19. And there were some people who were working in Mississippi that was young as, as 16 and 15 and 14 years old that worked in projects and was out there trying to get people registered for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and take them down to the polls to vote. Now just think about it, because a lot of people don't think, don't ever think about it. But these f young people like myself had to go out and get people to come into harm's way. So anything could happen to them if they made the effort to go vote. But you had to make them, uh, not make them, but you had to try to plea with them to get them to understand the importance and significance of raising those kinds of questions within, you know, within the uh, kind of a positive political kind of way. And so the person that you get to go out there could be killed. Uh, the person who goes out there, their home could be burned down. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan could shoot it up and kill somebody in the house. Those are the kinds of, of, uh, of uh, situations that we had to address and we had to deal with. Do you, do you wanna be responsible or are you responsible for what happens to the people who you put in harm's way? Are you responsible for that? Would they have been killed if they hadn't participated in that? You can't answer those questions philosophically because you have a mission that you think is important, so important, and it has to do with the, the future of humanity, the future of mankind, that you want to raise that so that people understand that sometimes you have to stand up and say, I want to control my own destiny. I want to control my own life. I want to be my own person. I don't want to be owned by anybody. And so we thought that that was so important principally that those things operated. And I'm just saying that to say that, you know, we were committed principally. We weren't there because it was a lock or something good to do because it had more negatives than it had positives. I mean, you know, you get, your house would get shot in in the summer of 1964. Every single month that the Mississippi Summer Project went on, you had, um, you had some incident somewhere every day. And we ended up not just having the three murders, but we ended up having six cases of young people getting killed, a total of six, during that summer. And, uh, the three that got killed first were three that were on the projects with us. They were our comrades, our friends, our co-workers, whatever you want to call them, that's who they were. And, and we felt very heavy, had very heavy hearts when they were, were killed. And we knew almost instantly, within 24 hours, that they were dead. So again, you're talking about a 17, 18 year old that have to deal with that, very similar to what people talked about they had to experience when they went to, to, to Vietnam and to war. But uh, I, I think Dr. King understood, you know, what was going on because he was out there and he had experienced some of those things himself. Um, I want to go back just one second, but when you mm -hmm. talked about, just can you paint the picture when you would say, you were so clear, you would say, uh, the Lord to King and how it responded, can you sort of give us a little bit to sort of paint that picture? Like, how, how would you be talking to him and then call him, you know, pretending that he's, you know, calling him the Lord and then how he Well, that was, that was because we always had a tremendous amount of respect uh, for Dr. King and the humility. That was who we were as, a, as an individual. And so we would put him on a high, high, uh, higher status. And that we thought that that was a kind of cute way to do that kind of thing. That's, that's, that's all it was. And so we would, you know, we'd be sitting around, maybe all Snickers, and we'd be looking at the news or something. We'd say, come here, come here, come here, the Lord's on. And everybody knew who that was, and that was a smile. And we understood that. But it was not a derogatory kind of term. But people made it to be that kind of thing. 
but it was it was kind of uplifting for us because we always had that kind of humility and uh, we always had that kind of respect and we always saw him as being an invaluable you know uh, movement veteran no, and I that's what it was kind of loving a loving teasing but you said you talked about times when you might have said it to him and yeah I mean if fun. you said it to him he was he would just hmm Y'all, you know, just kind of, you know, but he didn't, I mean, he didn't find it offensive in that sense. He would just say, oh, there go them Snickers again. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way, that's the way he, he treated that. But uh, Dr. King had a very good relationship with SNCC during his entire existence. And so did SNCC have with Dr. King. Now, I'm not, I can't say that there might have been people, individuals who might have had some conflicts, but in terms of organizationally and knowing what we were engaged in, how serious the matter was, we didn't have a lot of time being upset or distracted. There were a lot of different organizations doing a lot of different things. And what we found was that we had to go much faster because we had done some things that were successful. 64 with the 64 Civil Rights Bill, we had taken care of the public accommodation testing. You didn't have to go back to that, you didn't think. Some people went back to it, like the students at South Carolina State in, in 1968. But we had pretty much moved beyond that. What do you do next? Well, you get people registered to vote. What do you do when you get them registered to vote? And where do, you, where, do you, where do you have them aligning themselves? And what we found with the, uh, with the Democratic Party challenge was that the Democratic Party uh, at that time wanted power over morality. So they allowed um, the, the um, I guess, the resolve to go forward. And, and most of the people from Mississippi said, we have come too, too far. We work too hard to get a kind of handout like this. And it doesn't represent what we were trying to achieve. Of course. So we're gonna turn it down and go back. So uh, Dr. King was, was you know, always engaged in that. And that was the kind of thing that, uh, that we, we would talk with Dr. King about. Can we talk about, uh, you know, we'll have a lot of extensive footage, of course, about of Stokely Carmichael. Can you talk about your relationship to Stokely and um, how you met, and um, and how he became chairman of SNCC. Um, Stokely Carmichael was a rebel at Howard University when I went to school there as a freshman in 1962, fall of 1962, and uh, I was looking for all of the rebels that I could find and. Lo and behold, what I, what I discovered was there weren't but about 10 or 11 at the institution. And so I was able to find them through the Canterbury Society in the Canterbury House in which this organization called Nonviolent Action Group, NAG, was, was there. And all of the, the uh, Snickers uh, were a part of this NAG group. And so they recruited uh, new students that were coming in, and we got engaged and involved. And so that's where I met uh, Stokely. And uh, in 19, uh, the academic year 1963, uh, 1964, uh, that spring I, I moved in uh, to Stokely's apartment. It might have been in the fall. I moved in with Stokely, and uh, we um, we were busy organizing in Cambridge, um, Maryland, under um, um, if I can't remember her name, she's gonna kill me, but that's okay. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. But um, we were we were working in Cambridge, and I was getting a. Uh, full experience of organizing community in Cambridge. And we ended up um, uh, trying to block uh, Governor George Wallace, who was running for governor, I think, during that time. And, um, and we all got arrested. 
and that was my first civil rights arrest. And uh, I worked in Cambridge for the probably the entirety of the, 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 the fall and spring of 1963. I also um, worked in the, in the fall of 1963 in August uh, with Stokely through the time of the March on Washington. And so Bide Rusting, who was a, a friend of Stokely's, um, when it was time to get the, uh, the kind of cannon fodder for the march, I mean, those people who would, you know, print programs and place them on posters and make sandwiches and all that kind of stuff and do the logistical work and run errands and all those kinds of things, he called on several Snickers to do that for him. Uh, one of them was um, Ivanhoe Donaldson and, and uh, Joyce Latner. And uh, I was one of those people who kind of went in there. Now Stokely was not in Washington for that, but we had worked on those things up to that time. So he was, he was kind of committed to uh, being there. And then we were able through that process get a lot of the SNCC organizers out of, uh, out of Mississippi and Southwest Georgia to the March on Washington. So we were able to give them that kind of experience. And we were also able to learn about organizing from Bide Rustin, who was probably one of the best organizers there is. So um, my, my relationship to him was to, to kind of be an understudy, an underlink. Um, when I actually got in SNCC through Ella Baker and uh, Bob Moses, I learned how to uh, arrest the uh, ego and that that was required for SNCC. You, uh, although many of those people who were coming in were talkers and very articulate, uh, you learn a certain protocol in SNCC, and that was you talk when you have something to say. And when you ran out of it making sense, or you ran out of it based on any kind of, of, of reading, or any kind of particular philosophy and all, then you needed to quit, because they were going to make you quit. Um, so I was an understudy, underlink, trying to share some of his prior experiences and, and at the same time um, trying to learn as much as I possibly could because I had g generally made a commitment to go to Mississippi for the S Mississippi Summer Project right. and so we organized those people but that's where we that's where we got started but my relationship with Stokely continued we served as um, as um, um, officers of SNCC he as chairperson and me as the program director uh, for the next, I guess it was um, um, till, till, till we both uh, left the organization in 1968. Um, and so I, I, I got to know him very well. We were almost like brothers. And um, we, you know, we were engaged in his running for election with, with against John Lewis, and uh, staying up all night to get that election straightened out. And it ended up being that Stokely became the chairman of SNCC, and John Lewis um, was very resentful and uh, and left SNCC shortly after that, and uh, that created some some issues along the way also. Um, but uh, I think it was a, a, a good change. It was time for that kind of change. We were changing tactics again. Um, I served two terms as program director and during that two terms we were able to go um, from a, a position against the war in Vietnam. We were able to uh, to um, uh, bring black power along with the organizing in Lowndes County, Alabama. 
Uh, we were able to talk about coalitions and alliances with other groups, Cesar Chavez and Bellicose, Native Americans and Hispanics and Puerto Rico and Africa. And oh, we, we were able to uh, see our struggles here in America connected to the struggles in, in Africa and other progressive places where liberation struggles were going on. So um, we had a, a wonderful opportunity together to do all these kinds of things. And so um, Stokely was, um, was a very dear friend. He was the uh, godfather of two of my children. And um, Miriam McCabe, his, his wife uh, during that time was also a godmother to one of my children. So um, it, it was a very beneficial kind of relationship, a long-term relationship. And uh, I had an opportunity to, to uh, speak with him and, and help organize uh, the end of life kind of period for him. Um, you will see that on, on different occasions during the Black Power period that we met with leaders across uh, Black America and um, we, would, we would share those meetings and we would help develop strategies and try to find resources and try to be correct on issues that we thought were pertinent like um, trying to define black power, um, trying to get ahead of, and, and one of the critical pieces was, was that we, um, we, we knew what black power was going to be, but we were overwhelmed by the amount of response we got from the African American community. But we thought that it was important for us to, to, to define it but not define it so it excluded people. We wanted African Americans to come together and find the importance and significance of the principles of the movement. And, and the fact is that they had to secure their own freedom themselves. They had to push through. And a lot of it has to do with having the consciousness and knowing when you had to act in order for you to put that effort into, into uh, play. Right. Um, to that point, how did the how did the term first? When's the first time you heard it or you said it or was there was it, did the light bulb go off? Like, wh black power is such a powerful term, but it took it was well, several hundred years in the making. No, it it started pretty much after the um, the uh, snafu at the um, uh, National Democratic Party's convention, in which they rejected our moral argument about inclusion. And so as a result of that, we figured that we had to move outside and begin to organize African Americans around uh, issues that would allow them for retrenchment and to go back in and begin to deal with the issues of who we are and what we have to do, what are our goals and objectives uh, to get to where we want to be and in the final analysis what those goals and objectives were. Um, what about using the word black? That just was a revolutionary idea at the time as well. Yes, all of this emerges out of the movement. For an example, um, people in, in Mississippi and Alabama said, you know, uh, when they were talking about the, the war in Vietnam, why, why do we send our sons and daughters over here when in fact we, um, when in fact we don't have the right to vote in Mississippi and Alabama, so it's, it becomes very clear that they are talking about if you're going to fight for power, you need to fight for it here. And we also discovered that again, that black folk had no no power to to make a dramatic impact unless they were able to come together unless they were able to understand who they were and that they had to learn that we were not born in a, in a cotton field, that we had a rich history. Where does that history come from? Africa. So we had to go back and, and deal with identity, which is how you get to the first phase of that, and that is we're black and we need to 
point that out and we need to accept that and we need to own it. And so that's where you get the black from. But the power thing was, was that we needed to, to be empowered to do those kinds of things. Fannie Lou Hamer came a long way, but when she got up and presented her information, there was resistance to that uh, on the part of the Democratic Party. So she, she could say things and she could have certain kinds of experience and do certain kinds of struggles, but she was not one of those ones that they were interested in having take those seats. Uh, if she was, she was going to be the only one. And she did not, she, she rejected that notion that there's a special group of Negroes who should be the ones that are negotiating on the behalf of all black people. And so we, we, we saw it as being important. And when we went to, to, to Alabama to organize, you know, the folk in Alabama, this was Stokely's project, got together to talk about what would be the, um, what would be the, um, the symbol. The, the symbol for the Democratic Party in Alabama was a, a white rooster that said white supremacy forever. And, uh, and so they were talking about this, this symbol and they went through everything, the donkey, the elephant, you know, and then they got to the Black Panther and the guy was explaining, it's sleek, it's fear, fearless, you know, it's, it's beautiful, you know, who is that? That's us. So they, they named the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, um, the press did, the Black Panther Party because they were getting ready to talk about how negative it is and, and it's self-isolation and self-segregation and all those kinds of things when we were talking about having an open society. But it became very honest and open that what we had done in Mississippi what we had done in Alabama, what we had done everywhere in terms of organizing and resistance in the urban center, that the only people that we were impacting were African-American communities. That's the reality of it, because you begin to see, you know, as soon as you got through the great society programs, you begin to see uh, a resistance to that and you begin to see opposition growing. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example that just for the pur purpose of thought, and that is we are still dealing with education in the United States from the Southern Manifesto, which is when all of the white dem 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 Democratic officials who said that they were opposed to the desegregation of the school and talked about uh, overthrowing the Brown versus Board of Education decision said that we will use every method that was uh, was uh, lawful to uh, overturn that effort and so we have seen from that time all the way through today even talking about choice choice is still an effort made to destroy the public school systems and there has been every effort made to destroy the public school system who uses the public school system now? The poor. And so the educational system is what it is because you don't, you don't have the funding and the resources that are necessary to make the school what it is. And everybody talk about you, you spend so much money and you don't get any results. Well, if there are low expectations in most of the high schools that have the majority of black students in it, painted on the wall so all the students know that they, they are not expected to learn. But they can learn, for an example, when you use athletes, they can learn six, pay, six books full of plays and, and remember where they're supposed to be and all that kind of stuff. They obviously can, can, uh, can, can learn. It's just a matter of teaching them. Of course. All right, so yeah. I, 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 I digress no, on no, that. Okay. That's wonderful. I just want to jump back to like the, the big moment of, um, like, you know, when did it become clear with you and Stokely that, that this commitment to nonviolence, like, first was problematic and then there was a break? If you could walk us through okay. that. Okay. Well, let me start you back with SNCC. SNCC was always a lot different from many of the other organizations. A lot of it had to do with our youthfulness and it also had to do with our experiences. Most of the people in SNCC 
we're not nonviolent in, in terms of principles and beliefs. They, were, they saw nonviolence as a tactic, and it was a very important tactic. And it, in, in the public accommodation testing phase of it, it saved lives and it saved harm to those who were participating in that. And so it also gave America an opportunity to see what the resistance was like when the press wasn't there, uh, when the news wasn't there, the TV wasn't there. So we employed it where it was needed, but it was never a way of life for us. And Dr. King actually um, uh, understood that we didn't, we didn't embrace the nonviolence as he braced nonviolence, as being a preacher. It was a, a part of the morality to be nonviolent, turn the other cheek and that kind of thing. Well, most people across the South that we were working with, when you, know, you went to Mississippi, a lot of them would have you know, shotguns up near the window. And they would say that, I know you all are, are nonviolent, and uh, if somebody fires in the house, we're going to fire back. And, and they said, well, we, we have a, a, a shotgun or rifle over here for you, but you don't have to take it because we understand that you're nonviolent. But they were willing, as a probably human principle, to defend their families. And that never left. Nobody, nobody took that away from them. And we weren't prepared to take that away from them. So I think that that's where you begin to see the whole notion about SNCC and nonviolence. We never were an organization that embraced nonviolence as a principle, as a way of life, okay? And so it was very easy to change tactics because that's what we saw happening. We were not sitting in, in at lunch counters in 1966. You know, we weren't riding the bus to open up uh, uh, public transportation operations. We had already taken care of that, not in 1966. And so we were moving along and, and we didn't see that as a, as a radical change. Can we talk, can you, for those who don't know, can you go back and tell us who is James Meredith and set the stage for the, the March Against Fear and how that came about? Okay, we're, we're talking about uh, 1966 uh, shortly after the election of Stokely Carmichael and the others to Stokely being chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And uh, we left um, Atlanta and we went around to examine the projects and see what kinds of resources we had, what people were doing and that kind of thing, making an assessment. We were trying to make an assessment of the resources of the organization and see how we could better utilize those resources. So we were in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, when someone came along and told us that uh, James Meredith, who was the uh, person who uh, integrated the, the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss, uh, had been shot and killed. And so we, that's all the information they had. They didn't know anything about what was happening next and that kind of thing. And uh, we, we thought that he had been killed and uh, we were kind of toying with the idea of going to Memphis or what we would do. Then we found out that he wasn't killed. He was shot in the head and uh, he had fell to the ground and that's, that's the picture they had. But he was not killed and that he was in a local hospital there in, uh, in, uh, in, in Memphis. So we left Memphis, headed to the next day, headed to the um, to, uh, we left Pine, Pine Bluff, headed to, um, to uh, Memphis, and it wasn't that, that far a distance away. And when we got there, we found uh, out the hospital, and we went by there. And at the hospital, we ran into Dr. King, and, and uh, later um, we ran into Floyd McKissick and Dr. King, head of president of SCLC, Floyd McKissick, chair of, of uh, the Congress of Racial Equality Corps. And so we talked about the march and, and you know, what needed to happen and all that kind of stuff. But 
we, uh, we went downstairs in the waiting room and we talked about it. And we said that uh, we, we don't want uh, this march to be interrupted as a result of, of uh, James Meredith getting shot because his march was a march against fear. And he was trying to empower uh, African Americans to, uh, to, uh, to, to have that kind of, of awareness, but at the same time, not being fearful of all the threats that had, had been uh, uh, taken against them. And, and so one of the, the key issues was whether or not James Meredith would allow us to continue to march. And so we went back and uh, James Meredith said he didn't, he didn't have a problem with that, that it, it sounded okay to him. And so we said, well, okay, we have a, a couple of minutes that we can get across the, the, the Tennessee line into Mississippi. And what we'll do is we'll just assemble there with a small group of people and we'll march maybe two or 300 feet, uh, maybe a little bit further than that, and say that we have, we have restarted the, the march that, uh, that uh, James Meredith had led. Um, after, we, after we did that, we decided to come back to, um, to Memphis and uh, go to a church rally that was going to be held at Reverend James Lawson's church. James Lawson used to be a, a, a snicker. Matter of fact, he was the person who d developed the first uh, principles of the organization and, and included the nonviolence that, uh, you know, um, a, a principle in, in SNCC's s statement, uh, original uh, statement of principles. And, um, and so we went there and we were able to bring him in and, and we all kind of got a sense of how we were all going to come together and unite and, and go forward with that. And so that's, that's what happened uh, that first night. And then uh, we, uh, we found out that, um, that um, uh, Whitney Young and, and um, who else? Whitney Young and, and Roy Wilkins were in town, the NAACP and the Urban League leaders. And so we decided that we would all go and sit down. And when I'm saying all, we're just talking about primarily those leaders and maybe one or two other uh, members of those organizations. And so we decided to go in and see whether or not we could all agree on how the march should go. And uh, we had a long discussion. We were back at the Lorraine, Lorraine Motel and we had a special room that we sat in and we talked about that. And uh, we, we talked about um, having the locals be in control of the march in the sense of publicity and, and participation and all that. We saw it as an opportunity to have a voter registration drive and we had mass meetings planned after every march at a local church in that community and then the next day we mobilized people and take them out to the polls to vote. Um, we also had on that night a group uh, called the Deacons for Defense who came in and they wanted to uh, participate. They said they would, they would handle the security, that, that we wouldn't have to worry about that at all. And whatever the local authorities do is, is another kind of thing, but they would be on the ridges and, and, uh, you know, and looking for intruders and those kinds of things late at night and all that kind of stuff. So um, Stokely said, yeah, we, we'll take that in and we'll introduce that and see where we go with that. So we started discussing this whole operation and we said we didn't want to have a national call for, for you know, clergy and, and whites to come from the, from the north. And uh, both uh, Whitney Young and, and uh, Roy Wilkins were opposed to that. They wanted to go back to New York and do this big public relations thing and, and generate all this interest and have everybody come in and kind of move 
the, the, the local people kind of out of the way and not have them take ownership of this particular march. They were supposed to be marching against fear, then they need to participate in it. So that was our thinking. We discussed, we went round and round. Everybody made their position clear. So I think the SNCC position was that we wanted it to be focused on local people. We didn't want a national call, um, but let them do and run this march. The second thing was the focus was going to be on voter registration and the mass meetings would be a part of that process. And the third thing was that we wanted the, the Deacons for Defense to be involved in whatever security activities we needed to have out there. We didn't want to call any militias and any of that kind of stuff. What we wanted to do was we wanted to have people who had done that for civil rights groups before and they had done that for CORE in uh, Louisiana, provide security. So um, Roy Wilkins and, and Whitney Young said that they still thought that uh, in order for you to get the message out, it would be better to go back to New York and have this massive press conference that they were prepared to do the next day. And we said no. Uh, we said that the focus should be around voter registration. They agreed to that in principle, but they said that you all, CORE and SNCC don't have the, the resources and the capability of doing that kind of thing. And we said, no, but we could, we could bring in the local people and they would have the resources in order for them to do that because the people they needed to communicate with were other Mississippians. We weren't trying to communicate to the world. And if the world decided that this was something that they needed to be involved in. And we didn't, then, you know, we, we kind of was cool to the, to the um, to the Selma march, so we knew that we were going to have a hard time getting this in to the um, to the SNCC uh, Central Committee, which was the, the organization that actually coordinated the principles and programs and all that kind of stuff uh, in the organization. And so, um, what we did after that was we um, we um, we discussed and discussed, discussed, and then it, it came to be obviously a 2-2 a um, uh, vote on what we should have. Uh, the um, NAACP and Urban League opposed what we were talking about, and we supported what we were talking about. And so it was up to Dr. King, and Dr. King said that um, you know, it was a difficult decision, but it needed to be a decision made, and he ended up uh, siding with, um, with SNCC and CORE. And he thought that because we had had a tremendous amount of experience there, not that the NAACP didn't have any experience there, but because we had a, a tremendous amount of experience there, we had just been there in 1964, that we knew the, the territory and all that kind of stuff, and CORE was there too in 1964 that we, um, we tried to, and we had the local NAACP there, not the national, but the local in 1964. So um, he said that he would go along with that and, and those principles. And the question of the deacons, he didn't feel that that would have any impact on his nonviolent philosophy and belief. So um, they were in and they just, oh, they just objected to that. They, they got up and stuff all their stuff in the briefcases and slammed the briefcases and went downstairs and said, we're going back to New York. And we thought that was the end of that. But for us, we had to send Stokely back to, um, to um, um, Atlanta where the, the Central Committee was meeting and, and get them to support what we were trying to do. And they said, a march, oh, you're on your own. But that was good enough for us because we knew what we had to do. We had to provide the resources, don't look to Atlanta, Atlanta for any money or anything like that. But we had a number of people still in Mississippi from 1964. And the march coming out of Memphis would have to go through those critical areas, Greenwood, which is where Stokely worked in 1964. Um, it would go very close to Holly Springs where I worked in 1964 and had to go through Canton and it had to go into Jackson. So we figured 
that we could mobilize people and we could really get people involved in this particular march. Not just mobilizing them, but beginning to, to begin to have them thinking about what do you do once you get the vote? What do you do once you get registered? And so we recognize that this was an opportune time to educate and mobilize at the same time. So we, we, we took that on and uh, Stokely came back and we had authorization to don't call us. Um, and so we knew what that meant. And so we, we rounded up the resources. I got a lot of my staff people out of, out of uh, Holly Springs. By that time, the staff in Holly Springs were locals from Mississippi who were operating the program. And then they would turn it over to even folk who were from uh, that particular area and, and keep it moving so that you keep building local leadership and, and building independent community organizations that could go ahead on and, and address the issues that they face. So um, the, the march started off with the NAACP and the Urban League going in one direction and the rest of us going in another direction. And so there was that tension in there. Um, but the, the thing that was so fascinating about it is, is that we kept Dr. King there for the whole period from when the march uh, started until the march in, ended. And uh, at night he would be at the, um, he would be one of the speakers. He would be a speaker, Stoker would be a speaker, and uh, um, the, the head of Corps was a speaker, McKissick. And um, during the day, we would walk down those blistering hot roads and we had a, a good time to talk and talk to each other. And so I think there was a bonding that took place at, at this particular march where, you know, uh, we shared things that we wanted to share with SCLC and Dr. King and he shared, shared things with us. But I mean, we didn't get into very intricate kind of things but we just talked about what we were doing in Alabama and how we thought that that was important and, uh, and that Stokely was just elected and what, what are the responsibilities that go along with that. So uh, those, are the, those are the kinds of things we discussed. And you could see that Dr. King had a, a certain uh, appreciation and humility about the people who came out. This was the first time that many of these folk had ever seen uh, Dr. King in person, and he was there. They didn't have the money to go see him, they didn't have the tra transportation to go see him, but he was walking through their neighborhood, they came, and like in the African traditions, they brought stuff, they brought water, they brought uh, from home, uh, you know, big jar, gallon jar of water, just cold water that they brought along. They brought fruits, oranges and apples and bananas and stuff like that so that they could show their their appreciation for him coming to them and uh, they would they would sometimes just kind of break out of they would be lined up along the side of the road and when he would show up they would just kind of move in move in move in until they had him completely surrounded and some just wanted to touch him that's all uh, some wanted to do, you know, show their praises and whatever else. And uh, he, he, he was very, uh, he showed his humility. Uh, it, it was very clear. I mean, and he showed his appreciation and he, he tried to show his love for people who were involved in the movement and how serious it was and that he was fighting for people. And, you know, it was like them touching the garment, but he didn't want it to be like that. He did not, he was, he was too humble of a person to, 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 to respond as if, yeah, I'm, I'm the king and you are the peasants. He, he, it, it wasn't like that at all. And he was, he shied away from that kind of thing and, and encouraged people not to, not to do anything. Because some people would, you know, try to kneel and all that. No, stand up, please. Um, and and I, he touched all the hands he could touch, and he kept moving. And they let him out, and they went home and had lifelong stories after that to tell about Dr. King coming to Mississippi, and how they became empowered as a result of the movement in Mississippi, and how they took on Senator Eastland and and all of the other racist uh, uh, leaders that you had in in in. Uh, 
in Mississippi and change the state of Mississippi. And how did Stokely feel about this kind of adulation towards King? Well, he was he was he was excited by it. He he had he had known it kind of existed, but he was looking at it in his own eyes. I mean, when we were in Mississippi, people used to refer to, and I'm talking about the SNCC people. They used to refer to us as rather than civil rights workers or voter registration workers, they would refer to us as Dr. King's brothers or sisters, and that's the way you know that's the term that they use, an endearing kind of term. And now they actually get a chance to see him, and you could not believe, you know, older people who, for the first time, had an opportunity to, to come up to him and, and speak to him and, and, and say hello and let him say hello to them and that kind of thing. It was just, it was, it was just a, a, a memorial kind of event, and it was a, an empowering kind of event, too that they had actually seen and they knew who he was and they felt very good about uh, him being there with them. That they had, they had some essence, they had some significance. And that becomes really important when you're trying to organize people who may be poor, or people who may be uneducated, or people who might have some kind of disadvantage to think that they are looked upon as, as they are just regular, ordinary citizens. And so, that, that was it. But Stokely was excited about it. And uh, he also knew that there was a difference between how people responded to him and how people responded to Dr. King. And that wasn't anything to, to be uh, concerned about because he didn't want that adulation himself. Um, I think he wanted to be able to be articulate and, and, and teach as much as he possibly could. But he didn't want people to, to make him a, a superhero and, uh, and clean him up and shine him down. Uh, Dr. King was in his straw hat and his sunglasses and his, his attire for, for making those treks. And at night he would also talk about you know, how, how tired he was from walking all day and how exciting it was. And he would go to the church and give his presentation and Stokely would come and he'd give his and so they were competing at times but talking about the same thing and that is empowering black people and Dr. King was one of the ones who who talked more about um, more about uh, you know in in areas where we had the majority we need to we need to vote and put in a sheriff or, and 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 begin to do that in those areas where we can do that kind of thing use our our vote to our advantage you know, and so he was, he was right on target and uh, probably did not know that Black Power would be coming a few um, stops down the road. But he, he said all the principal pieces to Black Power. How do you empower your community? Not only, um, uh, not only politically, but how you empower your community in terms of culture and identity and all those other kinds of things. And so that became important. How do we, how do we standardize and how do we make that history and, and make that identity and who we are and who we are as people and what we want out of this life and what we have already done to make a change or try to make a change in America and we continue to do that kind of thing. Speaking of the Black Power speech, can you walk us through, go back a little bit of those, the talks. <clears throat> this is the first time you and Stokely and, and King are talking and walking through the day. Is there, uh, is, do, you, are, do, you, do you and Stokely have a plan a little bit to sort of talk about, sort of the, unleash this doctrine of black power and the, the, sort of lead us up to that, that, that fateful moment when he says what, that? What, and then what, afterwards, how, what's, what's King's response? What we, were, what we were talking about is our focus was on mobilizing as many people as we could. We thought that if people had an opportunity to see this, feel this, hear about it, appreciate it, that that would be the key to creating a high level of political consciousness among people in Mississippi. And it was. It made a difference, a significant difference. Um, but we went on to, um, on down the road, and when we got to Greenwood, uh, that's when a set of circumstances happened that, um, that kind of triggered the, 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 uh, the speech that had black power in it come at that particular time. Uh, by this time, we also had 
uh, one of our targeted orators uh, come in. He was the person who could get people to uh, march for, you know, for their birthday, you know, um, Willie Ricks, uh, now Mukasa. And uh, he was on the, on the stump too, and he, he heard where things were actually going. So he talked about, um, you know, black power. That's what, we, that's what we need to do. So when we got in Greenwood, Sokley and his crew was, uh, and Snickers were setting up a tent for the group to stay overnight. And they had gotten permission to set it up at the, uh, at the school, and the black school. And um, they rescinded that decision. And so he was arrested. And he was real upset by being arrested. And he was arrested in the area that he had been in. He was very popular as an organizer in 1960, summer 1964 and, 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 and part of the fall of 1964 before he left um, uh, Mississippi and went to Alabama. So um, Dr. King also was concerned about his arrest. I mean, they were just, th this is provocative and, and they are trying to provoke us to do something. And so um, when, when Stokely was released, he was released just before he was to go on stage and speak. And so the person who, um, who, um, who, who I talked about earlier, uh, Willie Ricks, when he, when he got up, when Stokely got up, Willie Ricks kind of introduced him. And Willie Ricks was saying, and you know, what do we want? Black power. And so he kind of started, set the tone. Then Stokely came up and spoke and said that, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to, in black power, black political power, black economic power, these are the kinds of things that we are trying to do. And we are trying to develop models here in the South that we can possibly use in any community that had a ma majority black population. In many of the urban areas where you didn't have black elected officials, we try to deal with that too. So, um, um, the, the black power movement kind of got started uh, right there because when Stokely was finished, Stokely went to the front of the stage and said, what do we want? And the chant was black power. And then Willie Ricks got the mic and he just pumped it right up. But it was black power, black power, black power. And the folk were cheering and, and, and they said, Stokely is back. Our hero is here with us. And we need to listen to this. And, and there was nothing that was said between the leaders, not a thing, until it hit the press. And the press was saying that this is a march that has turned to uh, nationalism and the narrow nationalism and, and hatred and uh, all that kind of thing. And I'm trying to figure out why they're doing that kind of thing. But what we were able to do is we were able to, to kind of put that in a can, move on, and when the group went to Canton, that's when they set up the tent and the police came and, and uh, threw tear gas bombs in the tent. And then they started beating people with the rifles and the, and the butts of guns and, and, and just putting, uh, spraying uh, tear gas in the face and all that kind of stuff. So that was, that was a pretty, a tragic kind of event and Dr. King was in there too so they were everybody was just trying to get out and get some fresh air and trying to take care of people people were passing out and all that kind of stuff so they were able to do what they couldn't do on that uh, that couple of days before in Greenwood in Canton and then the march went on to um, to uh, Jackson but by this time the news, the, the kind of news backlash, I guess you would call it, stir, was stirred up. And so everybody was saying, you know, that, that, that black power thing, that's, 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 uh, that's, uh, that's, that's going to be against, against uh, uh, whites, and that's, that's violence against whites. Anytime 
in our decorum, when we talk about black people having power, the assumption is, is that black people want to be violent against white people. I, you know, I, I understand where that assumption comes from. It's a racist assumption that comes every time, and that's how you can beat down whatever it is that you might be trying to do, be it good, indifferent, or what have you, that that kind of discussion comes up. And so when that discussion came up, uh, SCLC sent some more staffers in, and they began to tell Dr. King that, you know, you don't, you don't want to get tied to this black power thing. So, you know, kind of slow down on your black power stuff. Let Stokely and those kind of do that, and we can push them over to the side and then have you and, and the, uh, kind of be the, the central person of, of, um, of rationale, uh, rationality, um, uh, come forward and, and be exposed. But uh, what we did was we decided that we wanted to um, push this whole idea further along. So when we got to Jackson, uh, because we had to pay for the um, for our role in the in the process, we got together with SCLC and we decided that we were going to have a concert. And so they said, "Well, who can we get for a concert?" And I went out and uh, and contacted my friend. Uh, James Brown, and I told him that Dr. King was involved in this march, and we were in Jackson, and uh, it's been a good march so far. It's a march against fear. It's in Jackson, Mississippi. We got a large crowd that's going to be out. Can uh, can you come? And he said, y yeah, where, where, where are we coming? And I told him, and uh, I said, and I'm going I'm to give uh, somebody else your number so that they can work out the logistics. And I said, you know, we don't have any money. He said, that's okay. He said, I'll take care of that. And so I said, well, is there, is there anything else we need to know? He said, no, I'll be there. And, and I went and told people that that's who was going to come. That information got around. And you had a standing room only crowd out there the night before the last march outside of the town limits of Jackson into Jackson itself. And uh, he he had a he had a he had a a, a good show, um, but again, you know, um, the uh, the fact that uh, we were able to to get this kind of activity played right into because we were gonna have a a direct impact on popular culture, with James Brown being there and seeing these people and marching against fear, he knew what Mississippi was that is eventually he was going to do I'm Black and I'm Proud. And that's what, that's what he got out of where we were in the march as we began to shift from just voter registration and organizing independent political parties to an, an empowerment to trying to figure out where we go at, at the next step. We had already made the um, the, taking the position against the war in Vietnam. And so we had all these things coming together at the same time, and we thought that we had turned the corner and were beginning to move a little bit out of the civil rights arena to a human rights kind of arena. And that was the transition that we saw that we were moving in that general direction. But I say that because the speeches were pretty standard by everybody the next day that, that I didn't perceive any hostility between anybody. And by this time, the NAACP had decided that they were going to try to get back on the march. And they had Aaron Henry to, uh, to speak on behalf of the NAACP. And we, we allowed him to speak. Um, and there was also Charles Evers who was trying to get in on the speech. And so we, you know, we, we just allowed it to go. We had been successful in doing what we wanted to do, and that is educate, educate, educate. And so and that was- There wasn't a, a sense of King, King never talked after the Black Power speech about, hey, you know, there's some footage of a little bit how he was a little, uh, and he writes, we talked about in his book about how he had to navigate 
the term black power, and it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been the term that he would have chosen right. at that moment. Right. That's that's that right. Now what what happens then? And uh, I, I shared this story with Garrow back when he was doing his first book on on Dr. King. Was Dr. King asked uh, me and and Stokely and Willie Ricks to come over and have dinner at his house, and that he just wanted to talk. And so we went over to his house, and uh, I think it's a basement uh, room in his house, and we sat in that basement room. He wanted to understand where black power came from and why it is that we selected that and why did we do it then. And everything that we could tell him about how because it was SNCC who did the Black Power piece. And so um, um, we did that. And then what we wanted to know was, when was he going to make a statement against the war in Vietnam? And so I tell people that, you know, we talked about what our statement was. We were going to refuse induction because we didn't believe that the war in, 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 in Vietnam justified the loss of lives on both sides and that we didn't think that there was a, a, an objective that was needed, I mean that was in place that talked about why it is that you're getting poor, mostly a lot of black people to go and fight in Vietnam when in fact they were in areas that they couldn't even participate in the democratic process. So, and I'm talking about the small d process. And so, you know, there were a lot of contradictions. And so he understood that. And so what we ended up doing was we ended up to agree on some principles. And I think that this is important because most people don't know that this event took place. And the important principles was was that as a minister of the gospel who thou shall not kill and those kinds of things uh, should be against the war in Vietnam. And that we wanted Dr. King to think about that long and hard because as a, a moral icon of the movement, he needs to address that issue. What we need to do is we need to keep people from uh, have distracting from events and activities that he wanted to engage in and that we would support him. If we disagreed, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hear anything at all. When we agreed, we would support him. And that manifested itself in uh, 1968 when he is trying to put together the Poor People's Campaign. And what he does is he goes to um, 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 the campgrounds in, um, in, uh, in D.C. And what they have is they have a lot of people who uh, are talking about it, a lot of black power groups saying, you know, don't go down there and don't, don't be a part of this poor people campaign and all this kind of stuff. And that, you know, they were more militant and they had all this kind of stuff. No experience in organizing any community. They, they had maybe militias and those kinds of things. And so what uh, Dr. King did was Dr. King asked Kwame if he would talk to those people who were trying to interrupt press conferences and all that kind of stuff. To, so you can go back and say to who Kwame, when did he change it? You said Stokely and you went Kwame then. Yeah, he changed his name. Um, I think we just go back after this, right? Okay. So if you just go back, just, you're just telling the story about how the, the, the going to the march, how, uh, how he enlists Stokely and you to help sell the, the march on, on the, the Poor People's March. Okay. He, Dr. King, uh, and, and in, in this dinner and discussion, and it, the discussion was about three hours long asked us about black power 
He wanted to know everything that we were thinking, where we were going with it, how we were planning to go, and all this kind of stuff. And, and we shared that with him. Stokely shared that with him. I shared that with him in terms of program perspective on, um, on uh, SNCC. We also talked to him about the war in Vietnam and that we wanted SCLC to, to take a position against the war in Vietnam, especially because he comes from a group of clergy, black preachers, and that we wanted them to, to, to uh, condemn that war in Vietnam based on the fact that it was amoral. Okay, um, at that point, we, he also agreed to not continue to talk about black power in a negative context. Not in terms of people breaking windows and all those kinds of things, but just in terms of a, 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 a tactical shift in the movement to talk about identity and, and those, those kinds of things. A, a shift in terms of talking about trying to elect as many elected officials as you possibly could. Uh, did you want isolation? No. And, and that's, that's one of the things that uh, we talked about. And in his, in his uh, um, where do we go from here, chaos of community, he actually talks about that, but he also talks about the proponents of black power. And he said that there were some who were responsible and those ones who were responsible were those who wanted to address the movement's shift again in talking about identity and, and, and class and those kinds of things. That should, that should be allowed to happen. And he said that uh, two of the people who expressed that very well was, uh, was uh, Floyd McKissick and Stokely Carmichael, that they should not be isolated and alienated but uh, in, in terms of SNCC, we did a couple of things that didn't help us at all. We got caught in talking about uh, black power as anti-white. We, we didn't operate like that. But that wasn't what we wanted. We didn't want to discard the, uh, the history and the legacy and the memories of so many of those young whites who joined with us to make a difference up to that point in America. But we also wanted them to shift gears and go over and begin to organize in the white community. So that's what we were, we were trying to emphasize. But uh, we had a group inside that, that released a statement that was released to the New York Times and the New York Times um, said it was the SNCC official position. And anytime something comes up where you have said that you're anti-white, uh, that distracts and that takes it away from everything else and, and your, your case that you're trying to build is uh, moot. Uh, we fought through that. We tried to explain uh, what we were trying to do, where we were trying to move, and we tried to do that with the African-American first because it, we thought it was important that they take ownership of black power. Now, we're not responsible for how everybody uses black power. It's just like some people, you know, got registered to vote so they could become Republicans so that they could get a handout or some, something, you know, if, because they are, in fact, a Republican voter. So getting the right to vote don't mean that we are supporting somebody who wants to use the vote in order for them to get riches from that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm just using that analogy to talk about the fact that we had an agreement on those kind of principles. And the example I am using is the example of when Dr. King was setting up to go to the poor people to go to Washington, D.C. There were a lot of groups in Washington, D.C. who were black power groups who were saying that we don't want Resurrection City. We don't want the march to come here. Uh, we, we, we want liberation. And, and as if that was some difference between what Dr. King was doing and what they were doing. And so he solicited Stokely to, uh, 
to, um, to, to talk with those groups and ask them, ask them just to back off. And so that's what Stokely did. He went and talked to them. He said, you know, for you who don't want to have any dealings with Dr. King, uh, just don't say anything at all. Stay away. Don't go down. Don't, don't try to distract from him. Just let him do what he's going to do. You do what you want to do. Let him do what he's going to do. And that's the way they worked out that kind of truce so, so that people wouldn't be attacking him and harassing him and, and uh, at the news conferences and those kinds of things where he was talking about setting up Resurrection, Resurrection City. So I think that whole process began to work. And, it's, and I'm also saying that uh, when he did his book, he, he actually tried to clarify his position because he started out by talking about what uh, the assumption was that black power was. It was isolation, it was separation, and it was all those kinds of things. And he said that that would not work. SNCC did never said, said those kinds of things. It said that we want our organizers, who are good organizers, to go into the white community, but that you need to have the African-American organizer in the African-American community. You cannot send a, uh, a white person into a Watts when it's, when it's blowing up like it is. I mean, that's, that's just, it doesn't work. And so there were times tactically when we had to pull back, like in, in uh, Mississippi, the white uh, people who were coming on, the white students who were coming into Mississippi, they were getting beat half to death just by showing up. So we, we, we said, well, you know, maybe we need to back that out a little bit. And when we are at a point where we are in areas where that's not gonna happen, uh, we can change that around. The same thing with Goodman, Cheney, and Sherna. Uh, they, they were killed because there was no, there was no stop on brutalizing and uh, beating them and being upset with them till they were dead. And so you have to recognize, you have to change your tactics as you go along. So that's, that was how that whole process uh, ended. Can we back up a little bit to the, the I, I heard that, or read that uh, King invited you both, you and Stokely, to hear his sermon at Ebenezer Baptist Church, uh, sort of a precursor sort of a, to his Riverside speech. Is that True, can you talk about that? He yeah, it was, it, was, it was not the precursor to Riverside. It was the first uh, release of that statement in, um, in um, Ebenezer. And, and we, we had it at that point set up because there were a lot of other things that happened in between. But I'm going I'm to do this and then I'll come back and get the in-betweens. But Dr. King called Stokely and said, I want you to come to church. And uh, Stokely said, when? He said, Sunday. He said, I have a speech I'm gonna make and I want you to hear it. And Stokely said, Dr. King, you know I'm a heathen, so I, I'm not gonna be up. He said, come to church. And uh, I said, and he said, uh, okay, well, I'll come, I'll put on my, Sunday go to meet and suit and I'll come on over there to your church. And um, he, then after he hung up with Dr. King, he called me, Stokely called me and said, we have to go to church on Sunday. Dr. King is gonna make a speech that we need to, um, we need to hear. And uh, a sermon, he said it was a sermon, a special sermon. And so we got up and we went over and we got there and we, uh, Stokely had promised we were gonna be on the first row, but we couldn't make it to the first row, that was too early. But we got on the second row. And, uh, and Dr. King started talking about his position against the war in Vietnam. And when it was over, we both stood up and cheered, Stokely and I. And then eventually the rest of the church got up and cheered him. But uh, that, was, that was just sweet to, to my heart because I had been a, uh, a resistor, uh, an anti-war resistor before and had actually refused induction into the military service. 
And during that time that I was refusing induction, I talked to, um, to Dr. King about being a, a conscientious objector and, and how to stand on faith and principles and those kinds of things. And he talked to me all the time. I remember one time he was um, on Auburn Avenue and I think he was down at the newspaper um, office on Auburn Avenue. It's a black newspaper office down there. And he was driving his Chevrolet, parked it and got out and came around and said, Cleveland, how are you doing? And I said, Dr. King, I am doing fine. He said, I got some good news for you. Said the Reverend Borders, which was the largest black church on Auburn Avenue, said that he is, he is in that jury pool and we're gonna try to get him uh, to sit on that jury for you. And if he can sit on that jury for you, we're going to show enough to try to get you out of this thing. But he said, you know, stick to your guns, hold on, and just uh, encouragement. He was, he was the person that I, that I went to uh, for that kind of encouragement. And uh, uh, by this time, Dr. King is also aware uh, that uh, I, I, I needed to be living my life right. And he told me that he had met uh, a young lady that was a friend of mine on the Mississippi Meredith March. And he said, you all need to get married. And so I said, Dr. King, when I am ready to get married, I'm gonna call you first. And I want you to perform the wedding. All right, Cleveland, I'll do it. Just call me. And so in January of 1968, I called Dr. King and I said, I am ready to get married. And I said, I'm, I'm calling you because I want you to schedule and we'll go in the basement of Ebenezer Baptist Church and we'll do this thing. And he said, okay. And uh, Stokely was my best man. And uh, we went down in there. I think Willie Ricks was with us too at that time. And uh, we got married. And uh, shortly after that came the Orangeburg Massacre where the students are shot and killed. I'm shot. And uh, I'm also, um, you know, uh, been tried and found guilty for the 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 war and uh so so i am uh going through a lot of things and the country is going through a lot of things and and uh i end up um getting charged at being involved in a one-man riot in orangeburg south carolina where three students were killed one a high school student Delano Milton being 18 years old. Most of the students who were shot, and there was about 50 students that were shot. Um, most of them were shot in the back and the ball of the feet and all that kind of stuff. And Dr. King knew about it. So he was one of the people who sent a statement calling on the governor to have an investigation and find out and fire the police officers and all that kind of stuff. And um, shortly after that, I was, I was uh, bailed out of prison uh, when I could raise my bond. It was exceptionally high. We had to go through the courts to get it reduced and all that kind of thing. But um, I had a chance to just speak to Dr. King once after that. And then April 4th came along. And when it came along, I, um, I um, was just shocked without belief. I was flying from Columbia to Washington, D.C. I was met in Washington by Stokely and some other friends. And uh, we, I was trying to figure out why I saw these SCLC people rushing through the airport. They were coming and I was going, I was going out of the airport and they said, I said to them, how you doing? They said, we're not doing good, we're rushing to Memphis. I couldn't understand it because I had been out from before he was shot 
till, till the time he was dead, Dr. King. And uh, so I asked Stokely and those, and they were, they were so busy being angry and frustrated, and uh, it was just, it was just a, so I'm sitting there like a, you know, a duck out of water. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. So eventually they told me that Dr. King had been killed. And I just, it was, it was a terrible shock. And, and my thing was, was that my relationship with Dr. King had always been a, a human being to a human being relationship. It was never the leader of the movement or any of those kinds of things. Because during my entire time in the civil rights movement, I never wanted to, uh, to take on those roles as the, the speaker of the movement or any of those kinds of things. Sometimes I would have to do that, but I preferred being a kind of under the radar kind of individual. And I was able to maintain that, and I think that that probably is one of the keys to why we were able to, to, uh, to, to manage Stokely as, as well as we could, to outrun the, the um, opposition, to outrun the racists, to outrun the local police and sheriffs, to outrun the FBI, to outrun the CIA, to outrun everybody that was trying to keep SNCC from moving uh, people, local people, community people, to the next level, and uh, and I think we were able to do that as 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 much as we could, and then eventually that began to catch up with us. Plus, for some of us, we we uh, started families, and we had to deal with some things that were part of our experiences, and making those kinds of adjustments. It was a a kind of rough existence, a rough experience, um, but we, were, we, 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 we wanted to do the work. So that's the sacrifice that we had to make and we weren't ready to talk about how that knocked us off stride and we couldn't live our lives beyond that. We talked about how we moved in, in the next arena, uh, you know, let some younger people come on and, and, and move it the next state, but maybe we had kind of, for some of us, ended what we could do uh, because we were getting older and, and, and all those other kinds of things. But I, I, you know, we were still committed and have been committed through the years. Our job was to pass along to the next generation that's going to pick up the torch. Uh, our experiences, our stories, and to uh, let them know that Dr. King was a real person. We had leaders in our organization, uh, Ella Baker, who had the same kinds of, of uh, degrees and, and knowledge and experiences as Dr. King. So that wasn't any difference. Plus we had the person who worked um, on, the, um, on the Poor People's March with Dr. King was Marion uh, Wright Elderman. And uh, she did a fantastic job. She was a snicker. And so we, we kept working on those things. And then we worked on, um, you know, making sure that people uh, recognized Dr. King with the national holiday and just getting people to, to begin to appreciate and understand. And at the same time, bring him down from being that shining star that, that people had done. They had, they had sterilized him. He didn't have any voice. He didn't have any any, um, you, you couldn't be Dr. King because he was so exceptional. And what we tell young people is that you can be a Dr. King or a, a Malcolm X or whatever you want to be. You could be a Ralph Bunch or you could be a, um, um, the Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall, uh, or you can be an astronaut, Mae Jameson, or you could be uh, Dorothy Heights, you know, with the National Council of Negro Women. There were any number of things that we could do. All we had to do is believe in ourselves and go forward. So that's what the experiences were like in, um, in, um, in the relationship with, with Dr. King. I, 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 I felt it to my heart. It felt like a, a part of my arm was cut off, a part of me was cut off. It, it, it hit me very deeply his assassination. And uh, then, then with uh, 
my dear friend and brother, Dr. I mean, uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, I mean, Kwame Carmichael, uh, it, it was the same kind of feeling. And it was for all of the, the veterans that I, I worked with and, and uh, lived with and all those other kinds of things that we, um, we want to, uh, you know, hold them in high esteem and say that, you know, we, 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 we did what we had to do, we did what we could do. Did, did we get all the way? No, but did we complete some tasks? Yeah, we moved the movement from 1960 to, to uh, even now, uh, all the way along. The principles and the guideposts in SNCC are still driving people even today. And those principles include the life and the history and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King because he made some ultimate sacrifices along the way in doing that. And to clear up that, that uh, myth about this antagonism between Stokely and, uh, and Dr. King, uh, they, they, they communicated with each other, they were respect, respectful about each other, they didn't mince words with each other, they talked straight, and I think there was an appreciation for each other. Certainly on the part of Stokely, there was appreciation for Dr. King and his work, that he was a good man and he was a simple person, and that that's, that's really important. And I think there was an effort made to characterize that with the horse and the mule in, 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 the, in the wagon, uh, carrying his coffin, that's what he would have wanted. He wanted to be, the, wanted to be able to touch the earth and, and the, the, the cloth of the earth, the, the people, and uh, make a difference in their lives and enrich his own life and soul. And I think he was able to do that kind of thing. Next question. Can we go back to the, the Canton riots and the tear gas? Can you sort of paint that picture? Andy Young talks about how petrified he was. Can you talk about the chaos of that night a little bit? Okay. Um, when the march gets to Canton, they go through the same ritual, that is set up a tent and go and uh, set up a stage. They used to have a tractor trailer, uh, a tractor truck trailer pull out and they would put microphones on, on that and, and, and sound systems. Uh, and then people would get up on the trailers and they would go ahead and speak. Uh, when they got to Canton, the police said that they couldn't, they couldn't set up and they couldn't have the rally. And the police were in uh, mass, uh, gas masks, and they had their guns drawn. So people continued to move as if they were going to have the rally. And the police kind of pushed them in and started lobbing these, um, these uh, uh, bombs, tear gas bombs, all throughout the, out the folk out there. And then people went and got into the tent so they could be out, away from it. And they threw the, the, the gas masks in there and they would just, as they came out, it was dark. But there's some film footage to show that the police actually took the butts of the rifles and hit the people and upside the head and all that kind of stuff and took the batons and beat people. It was a police riot in the, in the truest sense. And it was tear gas all over the place. So nobody could breathe except the police. And so, you know, Dr. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Andy Young was out there and he just, he just told everybody to get the people who are sick and let's, let's get them to an area where we can look after them and take care of them. And we were going to just cancel doing what we were doing. No use to try to hold positions and all that kind of stuff. Let's just get people out of here, get this whole thing kind of settled down and then move on uh, the next day. But that's what it was like. It was, it was like um, many scenes that we have seen in which uh, tear gas and hysteria and, and actual raw violence is perpetuated against those those individuals that are in there, like um, um, Birmingham without the dogs. That's, that's what it was a lot like. Um, and can we talk a little bit more about the, the debates? I, I'm interested in this walking 
We have those great scenes of, of, of King in the straw hat, you said just, and the three of you up front like walking and talking. Was there any effort of him trying to get you to modify your position of black power or nonviolence? Was there, you know? Not until after uh, Greenwood, Greenwood and the, um, uh, well, let me do it another way. Uh, there was no challenge to the discussions that we were having with Dr. King along that route until after the Greenwood event in which Black Power was actually chanted. And I, I think that went out on the news where black people were jumping up and down, poor black people saying, Black Power, that's what we want. What we want? We want Black Power. And, and because of the agitation and because of the black power, people associated that with anti-white violence. And then, you know, it began to filter back in because at that point, Dr. King had a fairly small staff of people out there with him uh, doing the march. And then the other folk began to come in to, uh, to uh, uh, Mississippi to kind of reinforce so they could kind of tamper down the, uh, the black power thing. And some, some, some of the people on the march were intimidated by the whole effort of black power. And, uh, you know, they kind of uh, became, you know, kind of concerned about themselves or, or whatever because, you know, they, they were intimidated by it. As long as we were talking about nonviolence and, and all that kind of thing, everybody felt comfortable that, you know, wasn't going to be anything going on, but you do what, whatever you want to do and I do whatever I want to do. So it was, um, it was through that effort that uh, we began to hear Dr. King kind of shying away back and off of not understanding all of what had happened because we weren't really listening to the outside world or looking at the news and all. So we weren't aware, but we began to see that, that kind of shifting away with communications that we saw in Selma. So we knew something was going on, but now is not the time to sit down and try to get an, an explanation for all of that. That's why we felt uh, very good when Dr. King offered us an opportunity to come over. And he, he kind of agreed. He said, I thought that's what, what you um, were doing um, and saying, but you know that he was the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And if he didn't get these speeches, uh, and if people started not inviting him, you know, he had the responsibility for the entire organization and everybody on there, families and, and, and those kinds of people. So he, he, couldn't, he couldn't at that point uh, join in and support, outright support of black power. So we understood that and he made it very clear that that's, that's what was an issue. But we said, okay, but on the war in Vietnam, that's going to happen too, but it's not probably going to happen as much as it would uh, o over the uh, black power piece. Did you feel that you had to coax, like you putting the pressure on, by like saying black power and Vietnam, did you feel you, had, you, you were consciously putting pressure on King to push him further to the left? We had a responsibility to move Dr. King as far to the left as we possibly could. And so when we had an opportunity to talk to him about the war in Vietnam and black, about black power, we encouraged him to understand what we were saying and to support those efforts. And so we, we, we did stress that he needed to, to take a position against the war, war in Vietnam. That was, that, was, that was mission number one at the start of it, you know, to, uh, to get Dr. King to kind of keep moving further and further and further to the left and to recognize that uh, we had seen that people in Alabama who couldn't vote and people in Alabama that was getting killed in Mississippi for trying to register to vote and all those were getting killed and, and all that because they didn't, want, they didn't want them to vote. They didn't want them to have power. They didn't want them to make independent decisions and that we needed to keep educating people on those factors. 
the people who would listen and understand and move on that and take those kinds of actions. We wanted uh, to, uh, to, to have um, the uh, community with the resources, the skills, and the power to make decisions about their lives as, as much as they could and continue to develop strategies way, you know, way after we had been in there organizing the first time around and had left. Uh, that, was our, that was our goal and that was our mission, to train people who could have those skills, those organizing skills and talents to get people going. And I think that you, you see that manifested even with the, uh, the election of, of, of Obama, that you had the largest turnout of African Americans with the Obama campaign that you've ever had in America, period. And a lot of that was because the community organizers went in and said, now we have a chance, go to the polls and vote. And for those people who, who we kind of write off sometimes for going to the polls, we said, you have a responsibility now. And people felt that responsibility and they came out and did that kind of thing. And so that was the first time that uh, we have actually seen black power manifests itself in a very positive way in America history that everybody who said, well, I'm not sure what black power is, I'm not sure what it isn't, get a frontal view of what it was that we were talking about at that point. But we were talking about it not just in the political arena, we were talking about it in every arena, in the area of healthcare, in the area of, of, of uh, of uh, education in all those areas that we address those problems that keep uh, you know the African American community from for being for being able to grow and mature and live a healthy life and be a part of the American democratic process. I wanted to go back to the um, when you first talked to Dr. King and tell him that you're not going to show up, you're not going to um, appear at the draft board and how he warns you, and then later how uh, the, the preacher, he says, oh, I've met this, pre the preacher is gonna be, he might be on the draft board, you'll be mm -hmm. okay, and then it turns out you're not okay, and you're actually, you know, you, there are repercussions. We can take us through a little bit of that. Okay, well, when, um, when we were talking about the, uh, when, when we were talking with Dr. King about SNCC's position against the war in Vietnam, we had a copy of the statement. We let him read it. We said that we understand this is unique to SNCC, but you still need to, from the clergy position, do a statement against the war in Vietnam. And at that time, uh, just before that, I mean, just after that time we were speaking to him, I, was, I had said to him that, you know, I will probably be one of those people who will be drafted and uh, will, will have to refuse induction into the armed service. And at that point he said, okay, um, you know, call on me and, and we'll see what we can do to, to help. Um, I, I've had several short conversations with him that, you know, we are, we're, we're on, the, on the road to, uh, to uh, to my stepping out on black power. But, you know, when I went down and, and refused induction into the armed services, I went downstairs and I had a picture made because I had Stokely and, and a couple of other Snickers with me so I could make my statement against the war in Vietnam and, uh, and why it is that I stepped aside. It's a long statement, but it talks about the struggles in Africa and Patrice Lumumba, and it talked about the struggles all across America and throughout American history that black people stood up for the rights of justice and peace and equality. And uh, we would continue to do that kind of thing. And we thought that the war was politically, um, you know, out of the realms of something that you should say as a progressive country that you're fighting in Vietnam for democracy and you don't have democracy in Mississippi and Alabama and South Carolina and, and all the places across the South and you have people who are shutting down all efforts to, uh, to have democracy for all citizens of the United States of America. 
And and then you uh, you said you ran into King on the on Auburn Avenue. Yes. And the um, and there's a, a preacher who might be on the yeah. The I ran into Dr. King on on Auburn Avenue. He was driving his big Chevrolet, and he was parallel parking. He parked it and got out and came around and said, "Cleveland, how are you doing?" And uh, I said, I'm doing fine. I'm, you know, still out here on the streets trying to organize the people. And he said, uh, got some good news, said that um, uh, Reverend Borders, who has the largest church on Ab Auburn Avenue, um, and, and he said that he is going to be in the pool. And we're hoping he makes it up to the jury and uh, if he's on the jury, he's going to help, you know, help you out there. And I said, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. But uh, he didn't make it to the jury pool. He, he got lopped off early. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a degree of hope. But we talked about, uh, again, you know, that, that kind of conscientious objective kind of position that I thought was important for me to make, um, uh, take. And, uh, and, and, and going to court, I was going to be steadfast. I wasn't going to be apologetic. I wasn't sorry for what I did. I understood there were consequences. And I also understood that I had to address those consequences when that time came. So I was, I was all right about the fact that I might be doing five years. But, uh, and he was inspirational in saying to me that that might be it, but you have to, you have to have you have to be principled about this, and you have to understand that it, it'll be a tough haul, but you have to kind of stick in there. You have to be sure of what it is that you're doing, and uh, it, it, it'll be all right. There'll be uh, justice at some point on the other side. So uh, that, was, that was our conversation there. I think he was going into the uh, Atlanta World, I think is the name of the newspaper. Uh, which is a black newspaper on Auburn Avenue. So we would, we would have those kinds of discussions periodically when I would run into him in, uh, in Atlanta. But he was, he was mostly on Auburn Avenue and I was on Hunter Street, which is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. SNCC was on, on Hunter Street, uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard, and SCLC was on, on Auburn Avenue. Both of these are black business districts in Atlanta and still are. But uh, those were the areas that we would find. If I wanted to find somebody from SCLC, I'd go by the office and then I'd go up and down Auburn Avenue and I'd probably find them somewhere in those areas. And that's what they would do if they were trying to find a SNCC person. Um, could you talk briefly a little bit about the, the internal SNCC debates between uh, whites not, white SNCKers not being allowed to, like the, to, for the March on Fear, making it on uh, March Against Fear, or just sort of kicking whites out versus protecting white students from marching in, uh, in I mean, doing activist work. In there, was, there was no other marches after the Mississippi Meredith March. Um, and the Mississippi Meredith March is where black power comes up. And then we see the, the shifting dynamics in SNCC. And what it was was that we began to, to uh, watch as a um, black power conference was held with leaders from the urban areas, New Jersey, Philadelphia, New York. Um, it, it was held in New York. And um, no, it was held in, in Newark with Bar Bar uh, um, Amira Baraka. Um, and so uh, what we would do is we would simply um, say that all these things, uh, in fact, are going on that we had, to, we had to address in our organization. Well, there was a, uh, a group in, in the organization who I called Renegades who actually developed a position paper on black power. And that position paper happened to have gotten into the New York Times. And when that position paper got into the New York Times, um, it was saying that uh, it, it was a kind of anti-white newspaper. 
but that wasn't ever the official position of, of SNCC. Even when it came into SNCC, it was never voted on as being the official position on SNCC in regards to black power. But anytime that notion about you being anti-white, uh, um, you know, uh, th that creates a backlash and, and you're not going to be able to get your message through. So it was unfortunate that that, that information got out there. And at that point, you know, the debate started in, um, in SNCC about the, um, the, the removal of, um, of uh, uh, whites from the organization. And my thing was, was that what we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that whites understood. And we had already talked to the Southern Regional Council and, and, uh, and uh, Ann Braden and, and a number of white Southerners who had been engaged in civil rights for a long period of time and told her what we were trying to do. We were trying to make that transition. We needed help with that and had that all in place. But when the anti-white piece come out, um, people start looking at us and, and, and turning their nose up because there were a lot of sacrifices made about, by young white uh, students and by white adults who pushed through on segregation and had to stand out and got the same kind of treatment that many of us received as a result of being opposed to segregation. So we said that whites, because they had done organizing in the African-American community and had some talents and skills, should go out and organize in the white community. And then what we would have is we would be in a situation where we could talk about whites and blacks coming together in some kind of alliance over a better America with, with talking about what kinds of systems we need to see and how we get rid of racism and those kinds of things. But until that group is actually organized, um, we're just organizing in the African-American community, and that's a reality, and that's what we were doing. So we didn't need to train any more white organizers to organize in the African-American community. We needed some of the white organizers to go and organize in the white community. And, and, and the result of that is, is that that never took place. And so you're beginning to feel some of the, some of the backlash from that now when you have poor whites saying that they haven't been treated fairly and they don't have jobs and all those other kinds of things well a, a lot of that has to do with they were never organized it was a group that could have been should have been and would have been had we not ha had some conflict and confusion about what was the next step so the debate centered around uh, people having loyalties in the organization um, and all those kinds of things. And uh, at that point, they said that, okay, well, we'd have whites organizing in white communities. And that's where it was left. And that's as much as we could hold on to at that particular point. Okay. And after that, I was gone. And I think they might have taken another position, which by this time, the organization is, is not in, in its best position, best shape. Many of the long-term organizers have gone. I have gone. Uh, many of the people who had served in official capacities in the organization, many of the organizers had gone. The organizers out of, out of, uh, out of uh, Arkansas had all but gone. And then Albany, they had locked in of uh, uh, staying forever. So um, stay in the long term, not forever, but the long term. No, it disintegrated. I wonder and so it, did, it's, it disintegrated right. with a lot of help from the FBI and disinformation and all that kind That's of stuff. That's exactly. I wanted to talk about the FBI. Did you ever notice the FBI? Did you have a, a suspicions about, about infiltration? And then we'll pivot to King and the FBI. But you can talk about the SNCC's relationship with the FBI and then... Uh, and then, we knew about the FBI, but we had enough sense to know about it early on. We knew about COINTELPRO uh, probably around 1964 when we found out about how they were operating. And the fact is, is that uh, the FBI probably should have been aware of the fact that Goodman, Sherman, and Cheney 
uh, went back to Meridian and was gone out to Philadelphia and that the law enforcement might have some implications in that. That never came up. When I was in uh, Orangeburg in 1968 uh, at the Orangeburg massacre, the FBI was, was staying in the same room as Pete Strong, who was head of the SLED, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. And uh, when uh, the Attorney General asked the FBI about a report, nobody, I mean, nobody told him that the FBI was on the scene. And it took them two weeks to decide that they wanted to at least let them know that they were on the scene, but they had a very fragile report. They didn't have anything. They had two pages, three pages. That's all that's ever been done on Orangeburg when the FBI, head of the FBI in South Carolina, was on the scene with the head of the law enforcement when the kids were killed. And you got a three-page report? No, no. And what they had done prior to that is character assassination. They had described me as this black power militant. And what I was trying to do is I was trying to do a, um, a, um, a uh, watch riot. That's what I was trying to perpetuate in Orangeburg. And they, they missed the fact that the students at South Carolina State had been active ever since 1957. That was probably the most activist campus of any of the HBCUs in the country. And you cannot let that go when you're trying to figure out where do you go and how do you get in and do those kinds of things. But the FBI have not, they have not been my friend. And, and it started out that way when I left Howard University. Uh, and so, you know, I was under martial law for, for, for not martial law, I was under the, the control of the marshal's office. I had to report every time I went. When I went to school in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Boston, I went to, to Harvard, I had to check in at the marshal's office in order for me to, uh, every month, and then if I were to leave, I had to get permission to leave, to go home or anywhere else. So um, the FBI, just like you see a lot of communities saying that the police haven't been your friends, and that, that was the case for many African Americans growing up in the South, but it was also on the national level with the, with the FBI. Did you have a feeling at all about, you know, especially after Riverside speech, uh, Hoover, was especially, you know, um, hell bent on uh, going after King. Did you have any sense of that at the time? Absolutely, but we all felt that, and we all could see FBI agents around and about, and they were very deliberate in, you know, watching you and watching your travel and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in in places like um, Mississippi, they had the Sovereignty Co Commission. And they would instruct police uh, in Mississippi, state police and local police, to surveil. So they got all this documentation on, on people and what they, what they perceived that they were doing. Not what they were doing, but what they perceived that they were, in fact, doing. So the surveillance was, was tremendous. And just as Muhammad Ali uh, case was resolved over YTAP, Mine was too, at the same time, around the same time. So, um, you know, I was, I was, the charges were dropped against me, but I had already done three months in federal penitentiary as a result of Orangeburg, which the judge said that I could not, I could not post a bond because of my moral turpitude, and he was talking about the Orangeburg massacre. And, you know, it, it's, it's just that the FBI and local police have not been a friend of mine, and I don't think they are even today. But J. Edgar Hoover, it was known that if we were under surveillance, that Dr. King was under surveillance. We, we, we knew that there were people in the organ, in, in, infiltrators in the organization, and we tried to minimize that in, in SNCC. So the criteria for coming in the SNCC at first was that you had to have badge of honor, you had to have some arrest, and you had to be on that bus in order for you to become a member of SNCC. 
or you had to be active and in an organization that was a progressive organization that, that you're coming from. So we managed to, for a long period of time, uh, you know, not have informants in the organization. Plus, we were young and, and we talked in a different language and, and all that kind of stuff. So it made it difficult for somebody who was coming outside, inside, and you not being able to see that they were like a, a duck out of water. But um, what did the FBI look like? Were they, was, which, were the undercover? All white. Now, the informants were black, but the, the, all the FBI were white. No blacks, all white. And so that would be the first telltale sign. Because uh, we, we lived in communities in which we were trying to change. And so, you know, it wouldn't be very many unmarked cars that were uh, brand new. Uh, <coughs> that would be um, anybody other than the FBI. And they would, I was saying they were new because um, we, um, we would recognize the local police. They wouldn't have new cars to ride around in. They would have the uh, old stuff. So um, that's, that's, what, that's what we, we looked at when we went out or when we were walking, or if we went around the block, or that kind of thing. Plus, our phones, we found out that we could actually not pay our telephone bills and the phone would stay on. The only reason that was because if, it, if, if, they, if they let the phone go off, they couldn't tap us any longer. And so they would tap us like that. And I was saying, I, at one point I was, I actually was in the, staying in the apartment with Stokely. And, um, and I used that name interchangeably because of different periods of time. That's all. Um, he is Kwame Toure. And that's how we... Uh, that's how I, I call him now. Uh, he's crossed over. Um, but his phone was usually tapped. And so by staying there, that meant that when I was on the phone, I was being tapped. And uh, when I was in Atlanta, he used to uh, come through Atlanta periodically. But uh, he would stay at 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 uh, our place. By that time, it was more than just me staying at an apartment. So he would come by and stay with us and that kind of thing. And uh, he would call me when he was away. Even after we had moved on from SNCC, he would call on a regular basis. So that meant my phone was still connected. So it might have been. Um, Stokely, whose phone call gave the FBI pause and the, what they did not want to reveal uh, as a result of the overturn uh, in refusal of induction um, charges against me. So, I was thinking about um, now when people talk about the legacy of Dr. King, uh, even, even while he was alive or in the, in the fight to, to get his, ho his, birth, his holiday, there have all been these issues in the, of, you know, the, the, of his affairs and the wiretapping of his hotel rooms and using these affairs to delegitimize his, his work. Well, they, they have used everything they could possibly use. Um, I think that when we, when we try to focus in on what they say in terms of the affairs and all that kind of thing, that's the way to distract us, and that's what it's, the purpose of it is. Uh, he had these affairs. Um, so did John F. Kennedy. You know, I'm not. I'm not saying which way. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. I know what he <clears throat> what he did. I know what he gave. I know what his sacrifices were. I knew what his principles were, and that's all that mattered to me about Dr. King. I'm glad to be able to say that he was a, a man just like all men who you know stood up and stood up on principle and, and sought change and worked to bring about change and made some of the ultimate sacrifices along the way. You know, he, when he got his um, Nobel Peace Prize, an award came with it. It was something like, I think it was $50,000 or something like that, big money in that day when he got it. And uh, he gave some to SCLC and some to other 
civil rights organizations, but he didn't, he didn't keep any money for himself. And I thought that that was, that was testimonial to an old belief in the African American community that you don't try to benefit in terms of enriching yourself. What you try to do is you try to enrich the community in whatever way you can. And he stuck to that principle. And that was the same way with Snickers. I mean, we had to give up that old, you know, um, if you brush your hair, brush it a certain way, uh, you're going to make it. Uh, you're going to be appealing. You know, all those things, all those traditions that we have had to learn in order for us to navigate through the dual uh, worlds that we live in. And so, you know, uh, Du Bois spoke well about that duality that uh, we live in. One is African, the other one is America. So um, I was just very happy that he, he held, upheld those principles and you see it in his work. And I think his work speaks for him. So that's, that's what I, I think about doc, Dr. King. But that was not unusual for um, SNCC to have that kind of attack on them. You know, uh, uh, Julian Bond, uh, when he was first running, they had all kinds of, of things about him running. And then they wouldn't seat him because he, he supported the SNCC statement on Vietnam. Uh, anti-Vietnam statement, SNCC anti-Vietnam statement. But uh, that was not unusual. That was a part of the, out of the things that, objectives that they wanted to reach. Uh, disinformation was one of those things. Character assassination was the second one. And so it's not, it's not uh, unlikely that, you know, um, a, a whole bunch of that stuff was rubbish. Um, and, you know, what difference does it make, you know? one way or another. Why not just go on and go to something that has some meaning and substance to it? Uh, I, I, I just, you know, when, when he came out with, against the war in Vietnam, I said, oh my goodness, he's right where we are. You know, he's coming. And then that means you have to speed up because you got some more territory to cover. You know, and he, he began to, uh, to take advantage of that. But, you know, shortly after that, he is assassinated shortly after that. We did it, he did a year after we did it, a year and a couple of months. And then uh, a year and a couple of months after the Vietnam Statement, he's assassinated. So, you know, this, this is the way it, it happened and this is what we have. And we were always about trying to use and being resourceful ourselves and use what we had to work with. Because, um, but the FBI, again, was not my friend, and most of SNCC wasn't their friend. And J. Edgar Hoover made it very clear that we can come down and, and protest in front of the Justice Department or any FBI or anywhere else, but that he was not going to protect civil rights workers with FBI agents. He said the crime had to be committed in order for him to send somebody out. And so, he was saying essentially that you're on your own. But when we were in Mississippi and started out in Mississippi, we didn't have anybody else in Mississippi to turn to but the FBI. And we had hope that they would do the right kind of thing. But, you know, we found out the hard way that they were turning that information in. You know, we got a report that says that, you know, there's a witness. I'm going to talk to the prosecutor and, and well, you have, you have sentenced them to death if that's the case and that's the way it was. No person in Mississippi, no, let me be absolutely correct how they stated, no white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in Mississippi will be charged with murder of a black person ever, ever. And up until uh, the feds went back to old cases, that principle was in, in place. I don't care how you kill. And the thing was, was that we found that, uh, I think it was Reverend Shuttlesworth that said, nobody knows but God above how many black men were in the rivers in Mississippi. But it was a whole host of them. It was a whole host of them. And, you know, they were, 
there were there was a, a scheme that you could do where you open your door up while you're riding along and the person rides by and the per person hits the door and slams the door back and roll on down the hill and be a, a statistic. Uh, you know, shooting out the car, or, or dragging people behind the car and all that kind of stuff. We've had some of those things in the 21st century. So, uh, so you know, th that's, what, that's what was going on and the FBI paid no attention to it just like the FBI sat on their butts and didn't, didn't, didn't even write a report on Orangeburg. And then uh, President Clinton got a bill passed where they were going to look at old cases, sent to Justice Department. The FBI came to South Carolina and said, I knew they weren't going to open up the case because they were intricately involved in the cover-up and said that they couldn't find any justification for opening up that case. Um, when you get to the the aftermath of the funeral. Uh, you write in your book about, um, you know, Stokely, it was surprising that he, talking to people, sort of going out, actually calming the, not telling people to riot, as you might, right. as people would think you would. Could right. you take us to, through, like, what happens after the, after the assassination, that's sort of a week after, and the, the rioting, what, what's, what's his role there, and your role? Okay, um, well, when I get to, um, to um, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is already in a blaze. And I'm catching this as I'm coming over the, over the bridge, uh, what's that, 14th Street. And uh, um, they are talking to me about what's going on and that kind of thing. And so, you know, the sirens are going off and it's, it's just a mess. And so Stokely had an apartment in a certain section of, uh, of uh, uh, Washington. I think it was Southeast Washington, D.C. And uh, when we were finished kind of riding around trying to assess and see what was going on, <clears throat> he said, it's time for me to go to my apartment. I'm going to go to sleep. And we went to his apartment. And uh, he said, I'm going to stay here tonight. We, we, I was staying somewhere else. So I said, well, I'm not going to stay here tonight. And uh, I don't think it's safe for you to stay here tonight because, you know, the police know where you are. They're going to they're gonna automatically put you in the middle of this, this burning and all this is going on. So you're not going to be able to stay here tonight. And so we... Um, we uh, had a discussion about that, and Stokely became animate. And he said that I am going to stay here tonight. I said, no, you're not. And so I said, well, we, we're not going anywhere fast with this. Let me do it this way. Now, if I have to knock you out, and we all drag your butt out of here, you're not staying here tonight, and especially not alone. And he said, I said, okay now, that's, that's my last word. And he said, uh, 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 why y'all want to, I said, just go out and get in the car. And we're going. And then I had him call <clears throat> the Guinea Embassy, I think it was, and they had a house for one of their ambassadors that nobody was, was in, but it was fully functional. So we went and stayed in, in the Guinea Embassy. I said, we need to be somewhere where we can have some sure facts about where we were and how long we were there and how we set the, up to get into that house. And uh, that's what we did. Next couple of days, we just went around the community to see how the community was, was, was doing and talking to people. We went by Ben's Chili Bowl and on U Street by 14th and U and uh, went over on Georgia Avenue and places like that. But um, we, we just tried to assess what was going on <clears throat> and try to tamper it down because there were children involved and a whole bunch of other people. And we said, we understand your anger, but uh, this, this, you know, this, you know, we need to see if we can work on trying to figure out what we need to do about the assassination of Dr. King. 
I understand your frustration and all that kind of stuff. We're not gonna, we're not gonna tell you um, what you need to do because we don't even know what that is at this point. But this ain't gonna, gonna help you a lot. And uh, at that point, you know, we just tried to get together with other leaders in, in, the, uh, in the city and we also tried to find out how much um, how much um, how much we needed to do to get involved in trying to tamper the community down and get people together because it was just overwhelming because we began to look at TV and we found out that other cities were going up and that whole thing and uh, I, I looked at uh, James Brown and, and his effort up in Boston where there was a, a concert going on and he tried to tamper it down too. But I think that people that we touched and came in contact with us understood that, uh, you know, um, America had and still has a lot of things that need to be changed. But we don't need to consume ourselves in them in that, in that manner. We don't need to, to, um, we don't need to kind of, of uh, destroy ourselves in that process. We have to have that sense of hope, which we got from the people in Mississippi. They didn't have anything, dirt floors, and they would invite you in, your, in their homes. You could stay there. They had commissary foods, you know, uh, canned chickens and all that kind of stuff to eat, powdered eggs and grits and all that. Uh, and they would, they would give you all that they had because they figured that was their contribution to this movement for change. And uh, it gave you a little humility, but it also gave you to see that even though they didn't have a thing, they had, still had hope and faith that tomorrow and the future would be different and be brighter for them and their children and everybody else. So that's what we learned how to get through the anger and bitterness and actually get the, the filter in place so that uh, we could also do that same kind of thing. Do you still have hope and faith in, after this last election and where the country is today? I have hope and faith, but my, my thing is, is I think that there is a need for a retrenchment in the African-American community that it needs to go back in and it needs to work on some principles and guidelines by which we go forward. We need to go back to identity again and figure out who we are and what roles we are gonna play. And we have to figure out how it is that we move forward. Now, if there are some groups out there that wanna coalesce with us, um, when we get ourselves all st straightened out again, we, we, we are not, we are not, we are not whole and we're not healthy and that I think we need to do that kind of thing. Um, I think that's what the, the Million Man March was about to get black men. We need to go back and, and revisit all of that because uh, this thing has kind of uh, shed some light on things that we, d we, don't, we don't need to go down that road and find out whether or not America is a burning house and uh, it set itself on fire and it doesn't want anybody to, to help it figure its way out of this. Um, um, you look at the vote, you see that the vote was uh, probably the largest number of African-American women ever voted against this kind of chaos and confusion, knowing it was coming. I mean, it's not like we didn't see it coming. We knew it was coming, and we went for it anyhow. So we have, to, we have to have that kind of hope and we have to have a, a period now where we, where we take a look back and we find out what we need to do to educate our young people, to get better health care for our young people and to do whatever we need to do in that regard. Um, and, and the struggle continues, but the struggle have highs and lows and sometimes you have to just take some time to go back and internalize and do things that you need to do on yourself. Police brutality is still at a rampant rate. And, you know, 
people don't want you to say Black Lives Matter. I, I don't understand all of that. Uh, that's the point is not that white lives don't matter. See, it always get tricked up. Racism is so pervasive in America that we get lost in that kind of thing. Black Lives Matter simply means what we said in Mississippi. Our lives matter. And one of the things that brought that to a head was when the, the students came down for the Mississippi Summer Project. We said that, you know, if we get out there and get killed, if, if, if Cheney had gotten killed by himself, we would never have heard of James Cheney. But the fact is, is that you had two white uh, students with him made it a national kind of event. And that's what, that's what I think people are saying. Not that, not that white lives or Hispanic lives, it means that black lives matter and we have to do something about that. Obviously the police and the authorities to be aren't going to do anything about that. And certainly a Jeff Sessions ain't going to do anything about that. He's going to make America, Alabama, in the old traditional way. Uh, that's just the reality of it. So, you know, I think, I think that we have a, another generation of young people who are on the cutting edge and a breakthrough and you see new organizations springing up in the African American community, tired of waiting on things to happen. I live in a, in a rural county in South Carolina where uh, Obamacare was turned down and the extension of the Medicaid was turned down. Uh, two hospitals in the county, the one in the county that I'm in and, and one in the Jason County have closed, been closed for two years. One in the, another side of the county, in another county will, is on the verge of, of closing down. Healthcare, if I were to have a heart attack, I would have to wait on a helicopter to come from Columbia or Charleston to pick me up and take me up there. The trip down is 30 minutes trip back up is 30 minutes. So your chances of surviving a catastrophe, a traumatic injury is slim to none. Uh, and people have to live like that. And it's because these areas are poor and there's a certain strata that are successful in the state, they don't care about anybody else. And uh, even the poor whites have the same issue. But because of race, they can't see it. It's, it's just black folk that's clamoring for health care and education, quality education and all that kind of thing. And so that's racism is still well and alive. And if we don't address that issue, we're going to keep going down the street. We just delay it for a minute and we bring it back. What I was saying earlier uh, about the Southern Manifesto is they talked about ways in which, legally, ways in which um, uh, they, could, they could be in opposition and get uh, um, uh, strategies together. Nullification is one of those strategies. Um, Delegitimizing the 1960, uh, 1954 uh, Supreme Court decision and doing whatever you could in the legislature to, uh, to keep funds from coming to public schools, uh, integrated schools. And, and we've just kept working on that and working on that and working on that. Nobody ever said, let's stop doing that and let's try to provide the best education. So we go from number one to number 17 in the world in terms of education, quality of education secondary education in America. Speaking of, of all that, and the last question I would ask you is, um, you probably thought of this, uh, well, two, it's a two-part question. What, what is the most, what's the biggest misconception about Martin Luther King? When you're, t when you're talking to people about, as someone who knew him, what's the biggest misconception? And knowing him as he was, how, were he not, had he not been assassinated, what part of the fight would he be involved in now? I think, let me, let, me, let me start with the misconceptions. Misconceptions were that he was this person who sat at the center of the movement, and he did sit at the center in terms of organizations, if you spread them out from left to right, starting with uh, the Urban League on one end and, uh, and CORE on the other end. And, and so it works back. 
but he and SCLC would have been sitting right in the center of all of that. Um, people had this conception that he ran everything. He was the person who was coordinating all these different things. And what I said here is that Dr. King um, was, you know, we were constantly trying to to get him to become more and more progressive as we were growing and developing and finding out new ways to do stuff. And at any point we could have stopped and that, that would have been okay. But it wouldn't have been okay for humanity and, and, and African Americans. Uh, so we, we continued to try to find ways in which we could actually address those obstacles, those, those blockages and that kind of possibility of genocide and all that other stuff that was, was out there talking around and going on. Uh, so so um, we, we had to continue to try to make that, that difference um, by continuing to move as fast as we could and make as much progress as we could make. And so we were out running the FBI and the CIA and all those groups trying to do that kind of thing because they were trying to uh, castrate us and, and that's, that's in a real term. Um, and so what, uh, what you have is, is that we have to find ways in which we can actually pass along the fact that Dr. King was not at the center making these kinds of decisions. He ended up being uh, at the center because of the, the progressiveness of these groups. So you start with the Urban League being the most conservative, come on through the NAACP, SCLC, CORE, and then SNCC. That's how, that's how that whole process worked. And so he had to try to bring those more conservative groups into the loop if you're talking about having some kind of civil rights committee. But there were times when those groups on the, in the conservative camp actually tried to destroy SNCC. And that's, that's a part of the reality. But Dr. King was at, at the central point and said, but let's go head on. You know, we can't be worrying about the slightness on the part of other people. If they will join us on this, let them join. If they don't want to join us on this, leave them alone, but keep moving. And, uh, and, and, and that's one of the things that, that, that we need to point out. And that the guy was a human being. He loved children. He played, you know, he, he laughed and talked. He was, he was very compassionate. He was a good preacher. He was very articulate. I have probably 25 of his, his, his sermons, and uh, I listen to him, and I try to see how he connects it, but he connects it. He tells the story. He's an unusual talent. He's an icon um, of, of the civil rights movement, but does he, does he have more power and clout than, than George Washington Carver? I don't think so. And that, that's what we have to do. We have to make sure that we don't get into a situation where we're looking for a savior to free African Americans. And that's the way the historians sometimes want to write the story. It was all about Dr. King. If he hadn't have done this, this wouldn't have happened. If, if he hadn't have done that, that wouldn't have happened. But the reality is, is that Ella Baker was around in the 1940s putting together the NAACP chapters all across the South, which SNCC used in order to uh, get into these areas that were so recalcitrant because of the violence that, uh, uh, and resistant because of the, and, and violent because of, of, of their, their history of, uh, of trying to maintain the control from the period of slavery and all the rest of that. So, um, that's, those are the kinds of things. I like, to, I like to talk to him, like maybe I'm talking about him now. I like to talk to young people about him like that. Because I want to be able to say to you, if you, can, if you can get an education, if you can, can have a social consciousness at an early age, then um, you, you will be in shape to do whatever it is you want to do. You can, you can be as articulate and as, as uh, skilled 
with the English language and skill with with uh, the, 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 t the talent that it takes to uh, make change, but you're gonna have to be an organizer at some point. Uh, this, this racism is still front and center, and you're gonna have to figure out how to make it go away. I mean, completely. You can't just cut out segregation and say, okay, we don't have any segregated schools anymore, but we have the attitude that was there then, that's still there and still resonate. That's why I'd say to us that when we look at history, we need to look at the Southern Manifesto. I'm telling you now that they said that they were gonna resist, period. And it's been 60 years since 1954. So <clears throat> we know what that is. We know what that is. And uh, we need to make sure that we keep it on. But I'm, I'm just, you know, he was a person, he was like, all the people I've worked with, and they, they were part of my family. That's my family, the movement uh, veterans uh, of, the, of the 1960 era, and SNCC in particular. But there were some in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in CORE and the NAACP that I, I felt very close to. And, and that's what got me through. That's what got me through. That got me through when I was in prison. That's what got me to, through when I was under under fire, gunfire, that's what got me to when it, it got lonely and testy. Uh, those are the kinds of things that got me through most of uh, my experiences. And I always looked <clears throat> at those like Dr. King and Ella Baker and, uh, you know, uh, Conrad Lynn and, and there are a lot of others who, um, you know, the Stokely Carmichael's, all of them were older than I were, was. <clears throat> All of them was older than I was, and they, um, I, I looked up to them, and I tried to gain those, those qualities about them and those uh, principles that they believed in were guiding principles and kept them moving, and, and some the worldview to, to be able to, to learn as much as I possibly could and understood that uh, I had a consciousness and I had, I had a, a a person, I was a person, and I needed to be respected for that. And so I, I don't change in that quality. I think it was the best experience I could have ever had. I couldn't have gone to any better university than I did with SNCC. And it took me to places that I would have never seen had not it been for SNCC. And it put me in, in with the, the most influential people that I have ever uh, come in contact with, and uh, um, and and it it brought me into ordinary people and learning to live and love and 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 experience some of that joy and happiness that everybody else tried to enjoy in this life.